everybody and we will be concentrating on the men's elite and the mass race uh, very shortly by the way if you want to keep following the elite wheelchair and the elite women's race you can do that on the bbc iplayer and on the website and on the red button everywhere you look london marathon this morning that's what we're looking forward to in the men's race ken and isa Bekele, one of the all-time greats on the track second fastest ever in the marathon never won london he's up against last year's winner sise lemma of ethiopia his teammates Legesse are in there as well. Watch out for Kip Ruto and the Olympic and World Bronze medalist Bashir Abdi of Belgium. Other names to look out for, Wayne Gebre Selassie could well lead the British men today. Phil Sessman had that honour last year. Can he repeat that in 2022? It's his birthday on Monday. Well, it's tomorrow, isn't it? Yes. He turned 30, so maybe an early birthday present for Phil Sessman, who knows? So the men, have just been invited to step forward. The elite men right at the front, you see Ken Nisa Bekele, the diminutive figure in the white and the orange of the uh, running team that he's a member of, right in the middle. Bashir Abdi next to him, the Olympic and world bronze medalist. Our lionesses are ready. There is Phil Sessaman. First, he was seventh here last year on his debut for Great Britain, Phil Sessaman. 2.12.58. He was on such a quick time. He's on for something even quicker than that. Uh, had a great debut last year. A lot of people think that Amos Kipruto could be the, the one to watch here. Could be a big danger. Says he's in Kenya, fantastic Amos form. Kipruto. Looking forward to seeing how he goes. Then we've got Berhanu Legesse. A lot of these men with some such incredible times. 2 2 48 in Berlin in 2019. Was fifth here last year. The Olympic bronze medalist, the world. Bashir Abdi is coached by Mo Farah's coach, Paula's husband, Gary Locke. He comes here with high hopes. The One European the record holder in the, the marathon. Well, he held a good few world Most records for so long champion. on the track. And as I mentioned, that 2141, it was and the second, but well, still is the second champion. fastest. It was only two Back seconds slower than the previous world record Ethiopia. before Eli Kipchoge smashed it again last week. And then the very popular Sise Lemma of Ethiopia. What a win for him last year. So often the bridesmaid in big marathons finally got his day in London in 2021 so about ready to start lining up behind them in Greenwich around 42,000 others they won't all cross this start line they'll cross the start line at the end of the park in their waves but it will be these men that will set them on their way in just a few seconds they stand poised with their watches this greatest of races, ready to go. So the London Marathon 2022 in this most special of years gets underway. This familiar sight, always special, always a great occasion. And if for many people, Queen Elizabeth II was a kind of a constant, a reassuring constant over the years, then surely the London Marathon is the same as well. Over 40 years we've come to enjoy these sights, whether it's this grand spectacle of the thousands coming together in pursuit of a common goal, or it's the ones who look for a little bit of individual glory, like that man at the front there is just heading off. We look forward to the brilliant performances and the inspirational stories as well, whether it's Spider-Man who's just coming through across the road, or Ken and Issa Bekele. It really doesn't matter. They all come together in the London Marathon. Such a beautiful sight, isn't it? All of those runners, all of those colours streaming through that start line and going out on a journey that's going to change them a little bit. They're going to learn a lot about themselves. They're going to grow psychologically as well as getting tired physically throughout this 26.2 miles. And places to stand here today on the start line and on the finish line when you see all of those emotions come out as they tire and they go through to achieve their dreams and that guy is going to be paying for it in a little bit well they've got a beautiful day for running you may even see a hint of sunshine later on who knows for some it'll all be over in a couple of hours just over for others they're going to be out there for six or seven hours and they're spread into waves to try and make sure that there's plenty of room on the road for everybody 
so every 30 seconds or so a couple of thousand will be set off and it will take almost 90 minutes for everybody to leave Greenwich Park there you can see how they're being corralled into their groups it's all incredibly well organized Hugh Bracia and his team as ever making sure that it's a enjoyable but a safe London Marathon for all and that wave system that worked so well last year is what's going to enable the London Marathon to grow even more into the future as well and to increase the numbers able to take part in this festival each year. For some people, they've been waiting a long time. Some entered this race in the autumn of 2019. There was no race in 2020. We did have an elite race here where we are around Green Park in the rain and then last year some of those who had entered for 2020 still weren't able to take up their place deferred on another year and so finally I think the numbers in the thousands are finally getting their chance there is also a virtual race as well for those who weren't able to get here 18,000 others are taking part in the virtual race as well which became so much of a feature of road running around the world during COVID and that's been carried on so people around the world are running their own london marathon today so some of them heading down shooters hill road then we've got three starts the other start where some of the celebrities start and the good for age and the club runners and then the mass start over on the left there out of greenwich park and they all merge at a around two miles two and a half miles somewhere around about that uh, all come together such a colorful scene so many charities benefiting we'll talk more about them in the coming hours and for some, uh, yes, there's been uh, issues getting here, particularly yesterday. I wonder if Jill Scott was uh, keeping an eye on Sunderland versus Preston North End yesterday. Boring, a boring nil-niller. Could have done with Jill there. Yes, yeah, so for many, getting here was a challenge yesterday, but I'm sure it hasn't put them off. They've managed to get to the start line, wherever they were coming from. And the planning isn't just about your training, it's the whole marathon week and marathon day, marathon morning, what time you have a breakfast, all the rest of it. Not only for the masses, but also for the elite runners as well. And there we see a couple of familiar faces, Emil Keres on the left-hand side and Andy Butcher right in the middle. They've been given pacemaking jobs to try and help this lead group. Andy Butcher would have been pacing Mo Farah Paula, but sadly Mo had to pull out during the week. Yeah, big step up for Andy Butcher there. And I know in the future, there's a few of us think that he can run a, a decent marathon. And I think it is in his plans to move up to that in the future and experiencing something like this here today, I'm sure will inspire him on to that. But a big step forward from the pace that he was being asked to set uh, for Mo Farah originally to come in and run with this lead group. And it's a swift pace they've asked for. You can see at the moment, there's not too much willingness in contrast to the women race where Johala was really pushing on the pacemakers and urging them on it's only Bekele checking his watch who's really kind of showing any willingness to go with it at this stage very early stages of course for 47 through that first mile yeah, it's an interesting this race uh, this year with uh, quite a few who didn't manage to uh, make it to the start line so the second group has got a few who'll be looking for around 2.8, and they've got a good pacemaker, Mark Scott, who uh, won the Great North Run last year, and uh, he's just <laughs> asking his other pacemaking colleague, I'm not quite sure who it is in that group, but they've got a good group there. And there's Gebre Selassie, when they Gebre Selassie now running for Shettleston Harriers, could well be the first British athlete home here, just in the middle in the blue. Was in the northeast initially after he'd come here to the UK a few years back, and then had a spell in the Midlands, but as I said, up in Scotland now, running for Shettleston, it's a great club. So he's wants to head out around about the sort of 210 pace. So I think that group will break up a little bit. 
pacemakers in a very nice natty uh, strip this year, isn't it? Remember the days in the in the black and white of Shaftesbury Harriers, which was Dave Bedford's old club, and the pacemakers for a long, long time wore black and white stripes. This is a little more colourful. Yeah, they can, can't make the excuse that they couldn't spot the, the pacemakers, can they? I'm not sure what they're actually indicating for. I think they're warning them for the bumps in the road. So they're putting their hands out to the side just to warn the runners, because if your lock, eyes are locked on the feet of the person in front of you, you're going to see it, of course. But if your eyes are locked on the back of them, you won't. So they're just indicating that those sleeping policemen or whatever they're called are in the way. Well, back with the women, there's still a large group here. Only one pacemaker, though. They did have two, but uh, uh, the Ethiopian pacemakers here, yeah, this was chosen by Yohualo. The Kenyan pacemaker was, had to be replaced in the last couple of days, so the replacement just flew in, and she's already dropped off the pace. So I think it will be all down to Yohualo's pacemaker to set things up here. So everybody is still in there. They went through 10K. We'll be heading towards 15K pretty soon and 32.18, they must be very close to the 15k points, and that was 2.16 pace. It always settles down the second, when that first 5k is always so quick, and you get a much better idea through 10 and then now through 15 to see what sort of pace they're running. And just look at the facial expression on Yohualo there, she's completely relaxed, only her eyes uh, are really moving and just kind of making sure that she's aware of, of any obstacles or anything in the road ahead of her and just checking her watch every so often but very very relaxed in, in contrast to the other women who you do get the impression are working a fair bit harder than she is at this point Jocelyn Jepkoskai towards the back of that group behind the orange vest of Korea who was silver medalist in Eugene yeah and quite a big gap then to the oh just all diving for bottles there That's so important athletes Give their bottles the night before. I think yesterday, by about five o'clock, they had to put them in. So they've gone through at 48.51. So they have slowed, but they're still within range. But that's a significant slowing through that five kilometer section. 48.51 for the leaders. Still a big group there. Harlow and uh, others uh, just look fairly comfortable at this and that's a, an interesting point because I think that the race plan for you Harlow had been to try and run pretty hard through the first half she really is trusting herself she's run so quick in the half marathon actually offering her pacemaking friend uh, a drink as well because she wants her to keep going as long as she can yeah, not a, a totally selfless act that she definitely wants to, her to be able to maintain that pace and just to have some company should she get herself away from this lead group uh, for as long as possible. So have what you need uh, and then pass on that fuel on to the pacemakers. I'm not sure the pacemakers are given their allocated drinks. I'm not sure there's space for them on, on the tables. They do, of course, get their elite fluids uh, every five kilometers that's how we have a little bit of an inkling that the 15 kilometer marker was coming up then because they went to the 15k drink station they can take what they want as long as it's attached to their bottle at that feed station and then many of these women keeping on a hold of that bottle for as long as possible and making sure they get as much fuel into themselves as this race keeps moving along at such a quick pace Still leading in the women's wheelchair, De Bruna. She was about 20 odd seconds ahead of uh, the American. And the last time we looked, Susanna was, uh, I think, just uh, dropping a little further back. Susanna Scaroni is now well over a minute behind. So that's, this is looking like a commanding lead. I mean, De Brunner's just played a, a very smart tactical race, and her, her push -in's getting a little bit uh, pushing's getting a little bit short and uh, sort of a, a bit choppy. But actually, that defies just how much power she's putting into the push rim, and she's still predicted about a 135 at the moment, which uh, Manuela Shah holds the course record from last year at 139. So, if this is you know course record pace, it, it might still drop a bit because it it gets a, a little bit up and down. But she's having an incredible day today. Uh, a really amazing push from Catherine De Bruyne. 
and in the men's race, uh, there hasn't been any change in leads at all. Marcel Hoog has been out front now for pretty much the whole of the race. Every time he tries to force Daniel Romanchek through, Daniel just stops pushing, looks at him, and then uh, Marcel puts in another big kick and Daniel is just able to sit right on his back wheel. And you see how close he's getting to the back of his frame. You know, he's getting a couple of inches off, he's getting a superb draft. And it looks there like Marcel's just having a bit of a word and saying, come on, you know, be fair. You know, this is like cycling. You get such a massive advantage if you're drafting. But Daniel's just dropped back in again. And uh, they're predicted to finish in about 122 at the moment. Uh, so they're, they're keeping up the average pace. But with Romanchuk, he's got a six foot 10 wingspan. He's got huge arms and he's just able to cover every single attack that Marcel makes just really easily. He's well within himself. Yeah, about 20 minutes left in that race. These two still so close together. And these twists and turns. Opportunities sometimes in the wheelchair race, but nothing that Marcel Hoog can do to get rid of Daniel Romanchuk, who's very happy just sitting in behind and being as patient as he can be. So I mentioned earlier on it'll be a best part of 90 minutes for everybody to get across the start line. Everybody being very patient, doesn't matter. You might be wondering how that affects their times. Well, if you've never taken part in an event like this, everyone has their own uh, chip, electronic chip, which determines when they've crossed the start line and when they cross the finish line. And that all gets sorted out in the wash afterwards as to where you finished. And uh, this year, we uh, mentioned earlier on, because uh, it's where I'm at the beginning, that we've got assisted uh, wheelchair athletes as well, as we see the next wave starting to come through. Pace runners ahead of them. Oh, get the watches ready, lads, ready, synchronised, off they go. Tough job to get it right for those pace guys. I uh, just seen Akram Shalabi going through there and he's raised a fair amount of money uh, over the years for different charities, but actually runs as a pacemaker in many of them and does a very, very good job at getting enough people around to the goals that they've set themselves coming into this race. Well, as they set on their merry way, and I hope it is a merry way for most of them, then we know that uh, still thousands and thousands yet to have their chance to start the race. Well underway at the front as well. We'll keep an eye on everything, but for the time being, let's go back to Gavin. Thank you very much, Steve. And we'll leave the bobbing heads for a moment. Of course, you can catch up with everything that's going out there with the masses on any of the BBC digital formats, the website and the app. And if you were with us on BBC Two a little bit earlier, you'd have heard the story of the Kerr family from Northern Ireland, whose son, Aaron, is in a wheelchair. And there they are, Mum, Sandra, Dad, David. This is their 50th marathon, the first London marathon they've ever run, because this is the first time an assisted wheelchair has been allowed out there on the course. And it's a very special day for that family. We wish them all the best. Hopefully we'll catch up with them a little bit later on. But now my next guests up here have all got one thing in common. There we go, that music, you can't help but move. And here they are, my Freeze the Fear pal, hey. Diane Braswell. And she is alongside her partner this year, Tyler West, and Mark Wright, who of course is a, a strictly uh, hero from years gone by. But hero, today, hero, well, hero, 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 um, that's it. It's a heroic effort. A trying hero. <laughs> uh, running the marathon today, of course. Diane here to make sure Tyler doesn't get injured. Exactly. I cannot believe you're here. I watched you last night, yeah. 31 points. Yeah. The real deal, said Shirley Ballas. Thank you, Cheryl, again. I've um, I don't think I've actually quite slept on that comment, to be fair. And I, I, I thought, right, he's going to wake up tomorrow morning and think, nah, I'm going to just preserve my body and my limbs and I'm going to just uh, focus on Strictly. But no, you're putting yourself on the line. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I committed to it earlier on in the year and I, I'm 100% I'm never going to let people down. Um, Dyer will be looking after me anyway to make sure that I just don't push myself too far. But yeah. Tell us who you're running for then. Uh, I'm running for UK Youth. So they support um, UK Youth up and down the UK, providing support workers, um, outreach centres and, and places so they can access confidence, um, opportunities, employment. They're an amazing charity that I've been running for today. Diane, you are utilising this man's energy and endurance, I feel, <laughs> in training. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, giving Absolutely. him the jive the night before. I know. I mean, you could have done the walk. Makes or something so like that. much sense. It's been your your training for the week, hasn't it? it to do has. this today, so you can thank me for that. Yeah, thank thank you. You're Diane. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and and this is not tempting you, Diane. You're not looking out there thinking I'm going to put my track. Oh, You're a it's, fit bunny. It's very tempting, but I think I'll just be on the sidelines and watch for today. I've lived with you in a tent for three weeks. Her energy is unabated. She never stops, <laughs> does she? So Absolutely. I, I can see a future runner there. Now, last year, yours was a very sad story, Mark, because on the eve of the marathon, having done all the training, you had to pull out. And Correct. I remember chatting to you, you were heartbroken about that. So it's brilliant to see you back here this year. Are you in one piece? Um, I am in one piece. My calf, the same calf as last year, is feeling a bit tight. I've got a little strain in it again, but it's nowhere near as bad as last year, which was a tear. Um, I think the reason why it's so upsetting is this bit, the actual day, yes, it's hard, but this is the bit it's all about. It's fun and whatever, but the training, that's the mentally and physically draining bit. You're out there for three hours on your own on the road, come wind, rain or shine, you've got to get it done. So to do all of that and then get injured, it was devastating. But I look at it as a positive because now I've got two years kind of worth of training. Yes, um, so times so yeah. wise, are you more ambitious this year than you were last year? No, the same probably. Um, I was a lot more ambitious about four weeks ago, but I got a little bit ill, so I had two, three weeks off. Listen, there's always complaints along the way. All I want to do is get it completed, enjoy it. My family and friends are here. It's a great day. We're all doing it for a great reason. The Get Towns Active campaign, tell us a bit about that. So we're convincing towns to get active. We were down in Brighton the other day, actually. If you're from Brighton, you need to listen to this. Apparently, it's the <laughs> least active town in the UK. Really? Yes. That's where Diane lives. <laughs> <laughs> She's, She's that's why she doesn't live there anymore. Or do you? No, I do. Oh, right. You probably make up for like all yeah. of it. Yeah. <laughs> she no brings the aggregate it. right up. Yeah. yeah. Um, and basically, we're convincing towns to get active. It's so important to stay active. I'm doing a marathon, which is out of my comfort zone. So just if you can just get out there and do something more than you did yesterday, it's so important. As a massive Strictly fan, what's the next dance? Can we get a little sneak preview? I mean, you oh. know what? I, I, I'm just... We need to see if we get through I'm first. I'm loving every second of it. Of course. Sorry. I'm loving every yes. second of it. We'll find out tonight. I we wonder if you do. Tonight. 31 points in the real deal. Let's see. <laughs> Jeopardy. Um, just guys. throw some lifts in. Look at these arms. Well, he can throw you above the ball. Never mind we'll, a one-arm we'll lift. Yeah. We're going to be doing a one-finger lift. Just one-finger lift. <laughs> yeah, I think they're spinning you around as well. I expect to see that on week eight. All right, okay. we'll do that for you, uh, Good luck, guys. Best Thank of luck. And, Thank you very much. And on the course and, of course, uh, with Strictly as well. Okay, uh, let's get ourselves then out there and see who Jeanette has got with her here. There's a very special group of runners with you, Jeanette. Alongside me, three people who have done an incredible job to get to this start line, all for their own reasons. I'll start with you, Jill. You're a graduate of Couch to 5K. That's Many right. people will know what that is. Great app to get you out there and running. Here you are now. I know. Oh, the start of the How are you feeling? I'm really nervous. I'm really anxious, but I'm very, very excited to run it um, in memory of a very close friend and to raise money for mind. Yeah. And to be there on the start line for your friend. Tell me what you're looking forward to the most. Finishing. <laughs> And seeing some of my lovely friends who've come out to support me, who will be dotted around the course. Really looking forward to that. Alongside you, of course, Dave and Sharon. And Dave and Sharon, you're running together. You are a dynamic duo. That's what I'm going to call you. And Dave, you're running for a really special reason, aren't you? Just give us a bit of insight as to why you're running today. Yeah, so we're running for Starlight, which is a children's foundation. And they help poorly children, give them gifts and toys, uh, and get them through difficult times of anxiety in hospitals. Um, we think we've raised pretty close to £5,000 now, but the more the merrier. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. Good for you as well, Sharon. Couch to 5K alongside your husband. Tell me how that was. Is it competitive? Dave was very competitive. <laughs> <laughs> he likes to win. <laughs> but, yeah, it's been quite a journey from, from us not being able to run to here we are on the, doing the marathon, the biggest marathon. You're going to cross that finish line together, guys? We are, yeah. We're going to run the whole thing side by side. Uh, we're a bit concerned because the amount of people so don't want to get broken up if we don't have to, but we'll find each other again if we need to. So I look forward to seeing you along the course. Good luck today. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there truly are some incredible people out there today. And uh, from couch to 5K to the 26.2 miles, well, that is the beauty of the marathon. Anyone and everyone can take part. And today they'll share the same roads with the very greatest in the world, which is really what is so incredible about this race. So let's catch up now with those elites who are out there at the front. They've already made a big dent in their marathon today and head back to Baroness Tani Gray-Thompson, Paula Radcliffe and Steve Cram. Well, we've still got 
a very close and enthralling race in the men's wheelchair. Nothing between the two. It's been the same all the way pretty much since the well, mile one, perhaps. Marcel Hoog, the defending champion, Paralympic champion, Daniel Romanchuk, who has won here in London, but Hoog, the pre-event favourite, cannot get rid of the American. Tani. So, I mean, there's just been uh, no break at all for Marcel. He's constantly looking behind him. Daniel's made no attempt to come through. And it's, it's totally within the rules what he's doing. But you'd say it's just not the done thing to sit on someone's wheel for this long and make no attempt to, to pull to the front. So it's, uh, it's really frustrating now. So Marcel's choices are he keeps trying to kick, but Daniel's covering every single break. Or he has got an option of just slowing the pace down and trying to force it through. But um, it's pretty hard when you're out the front and someone behind you is, is just not doing anything at all to help. Well, they're getting closer. The crowds are growing. This race far from over. They are on the section of the course where they are going, coming back against the when we get the masses, they'll be able to see runners on both sides of the road. Tower of London, they'll be able to see on their right-hand side, actually on their left-hand side, isn't it, as they come down here. Actually, we're just going to have a little look at uh, something that's happened in the uh, women's race. Catherine de Brunner. Now, Tani, watch this. That looks like she might... No, she hasn't got a puncture. It's current. It, that is really weird what happened because she didn't quite overrun. It's whether she sits very, very flat as an athlete, and you see she's quite often just you know drops her head down, looks up for a couple of pushes, and then goes down. And it's whether she just didn't realise uh, the corner was there. So for the wheelchair athletes, the blue line is not always terribly useful to follow uh, because you take a different line round the bends. So it's whether she just had a bad time. And now both wheels look like they're inflated. I think it was just. Uh, uh, and not a great decision as she was coming around the bench. She's still predicted to go into the course record and won 36 at the moment. So uh, she's, she's back in shape and back pushing well. Well, just taking a drink on board and uh, trying to concentrate. She's got a big lead. Uh, whereas in the women's race, it's just settled down. Yaharlo uh, is at the back of that group. Since she did just go and get a, a drink and uh, something. Uh, yeah, well, they've got all, all got their own drinks and uh, their own supplements that they'll have mixed up beforehand. But uh, she's now in the back of the pack there. Bekere, Kebede, Magertu, the other Ethiopians in the group there. Joanne Melli, Romania, former Kenyan. Then we've got the defending champion, Joycelyn Jepkoskai and the world silver medalist Judith Career in the orange. So all still there, and they've got a big lead, or pretty big lead, back to Marion Googie, who's the only one in the chase group. And just wondering, Paula, whether Johalo's decided, you know what, um, forget the fast time here, I've now got to start thinking about winning this. Long way to go, we're not even a halfway, almost halfway. It is, and it is just after the uh, 20k drink station, so just as I say that, the time's uh, flash up. 65.25 through 20k, uh, and perhaps Johalo was just making sure that she, she got her bottle okay, uh, and that she was able to settle into that group. Perhaps you can see some of the flags, the wind is picking up a little bit, so maybe she's decided, I've sat at the front of this group for long enough, I can feel a bit of a wind now, so I'm just going to sit back in it. She may also be playing psychological games if the pre-race favourite leads for as far as she has done today, Lua leads behind the pacemaker and then suddenly drops back. Suddenly all the other women are, are questioning, well, what should I do? Because until then, their race strategy was dictated to them by what she was doing. So she's maybe just mixing that up a little bit again, but you can see for the first time, instead of that single file or double file, back down the road. They are actually spreading out. Jocelyn Jepkoskai just moving wide, Melly moving wide to be able to, to see the road ahead and just to judge 
whether they're going to, to make any move towards the front of this pack, because certainly those two have sat near the back for most of it so far. Bukeri has also been fairly well up all the way through. Cabeda uh, as well is looking strong through this first half of the race, though, as we said, it still is the longer half, shall we say, um, or in terms of things that can play out coming to come in this race today. So it's certainly hotting up a little bit in terms of an exciting race to watch, but slowing down a little bit in terms of the pace, predicted pace that they were on. So from a 2.16 start, which we knew was a little bit skewed by that downhill section, they're now predicted 2.18 finish time. Well, Marion Googie, who had set up at a slower pace, but she herself has slowed as well, so for her target was to run sub 220 and she's just slipped outside that a little bit but it's moving okay there it's got one pacemaker she did have two pacemakers because the pacemaker who dropped off the lead group was uh, with them for a short well that, probably for a four or five k to be honest but she's dropped away and i think she's stopped now so they are they're effectively chasing around about what best part of the minute or more behind Yeah, just over a minute behind. Really interesting to see that group still there. And as Paula was saying, uh, Johanna now not the one who's dictating matters, not the one trying to force things at the front, talking to the pacemaker. And it's Bekere and Kabeda who are up there, and she's now in the pack, settling, just uh, maybe trying to have a quiet period of the race. And the fact that that last mile, 5.18, that is one of the miles of this race where it's very hard to run a slower mile because the crowds are so thick, it's so loud, and, and the atmosphere it is such a buzz coming over Tower Bridge that it's very hard to, to keep a lid on it uh, and not pick the pace up a little bit. So I think that does indicate that these women perhaps paying that pace uh, price for having gone out a little bit too quickly uh, in that first five kilometers or so, and perhaps Johala is just going through an bad patch as well I mean, it does happen very often they'd asked for 68 low hadn't they through halfway and 68 30 so there we are 68 46 uh, so still very very fast running um, but should we say the harder way to run it and questions now being asked without a doubt in the minds of those other women as to what's going on with Johanna meanwhile in the men's race, Andy Butchart, Emil Keres, who'd uh, been uh, asked to help out with uh, the other pacemaker, and Gogo, who will be trying to go to 30k. He's been told to try, and well, certainly 25k, so he's getting help with the pacemaking duties early on here. But Ken Lisa Bekele, happy there, Kipruto just grabbing his drink. Bashir as well just grabbed his as they all dive across to the table. A little bit of panic, and uh, Everybody seems to have got what they need. They always panic, don't they? And they must have run countless drink stations in their life. Uh, and they know it's coming. There's a big sign that says five kilometer feed stations coming up on whichever side of the road it is. They were told that in the technical meeting. And yet still, you see just too many people focused on the vest ahead of them instead of thinking about the, the race plan and the strategy and making sure that this early stage in the race they get the drink station, so no drinks for the pacemakers at this point, um, but the others seem to all, in the end, get theirs without a hitch, I think. Did Lemma get his? He's struggling a little bit, the defending champion at the back, uh, and looks as though he, he's looking to be working a little bit harder than he would probably hope to be at this point in the race. Yeah, let's talk uh, uh, this week at the Athletes Hotel about what sort of form C.C. Lemma was in, and by all accounts, he's in good shape and ready to race. But I mentioned that uh, one of the a lot of talk was partly about Abdi, Bashi Abdi, and then Kip Ruta. You can just see Kip Ruta looks to be moving really nicely, the Kenyan, uh, again in the white, just behind Emil Keres. There he is, just going through. It's his first London, so he doesn't know the course. It's always an advantage to know the course a little bit. Uh, but they he's are looking 
fairly comfortable with early stages. Yeah, and they all are all 26.2 miles at the end of the day. Um, so I think a lot of these men will have a little bit of a look at the layout, make sure that they've certainly run over the closing stages if they can, uh, and then just settle into it. So I bumped into Elliot Kipchoge in the week, as you do, uh, and I asked him for his pick in this race and he was just pointing out as we get a look at mark scott pacing the brett robinson there oh another oh don't take them the wrong way mark it's gone on there he had one job oh, it's because the bike heads off as they come around cutty sark the lead bike the lead bike has a different lane to follow and they followed the bike instead of the route oh well no no harm done So anyway, they... Elliot's pick was that it's very, very close. Kipruto will be in there. He thinks Bashir Abdi will be in there, obviously, uh, as they are. But he wasn't sticking his neck on the line in any way in, time, in terms of predicting a winner. So as they go around Cutty Sark, others will be uh, dreaming of that in an hour or so, perhaps, as they just set off on the start line. Plenty of room for everybody. The waves will continue probably for the best part of another hour yet. We've only just over 30 minutes since the elite men got underway. What an operation this is. And everybody is very good. You know, they stick to the wave that they were put in. Nobody starts to go, oh, I'd like to get off a bit earlier. I'd like to get off nearer the front. Mind you, there are plenty who want to be nearer the back as well, but everybody lines up at the designated time they were asked to and sometimes it's a good thing to be held back a, a little bit as we were saying in these opening miles if uh, there's a lot of bodies around you and you can't get moving too fast that can be a good thing in terms of having more energy in the second part of the race so a lot of people around you to help and support you through those tough stages uh, as well so celebrate being a part of something special today and if you see any of those purple jacketed people they've done a lot put a lot of work into organizing this race and making sure it goes off without a hitch here we go, Tani, uh, as it's been all the way on Birdcage Walk. Marcel Hook just ahead of Daniel Romanchuk, and Daniel Romanchuk can sprint as well. He absolutely can, and this final turn up to the finish is actually quite tense. So um, the pace slowed in the last couple of kilometres. Uh, the downside for that is it meant Daniel had loads of recovery. Even now, as Marcel's just trying to pick it up a little bit, he's still not pushing at top speed. Uh, and this is going to be a really interesting race. If Daniel sprints now, it, and he's trying. Oh, oh no, he's. Oh, oh that, that is was just a, not knowing a what he's doing. line he took there, and Marcel Hook tried to not exactly shut him off, but he's taking the advantage back. Daniel Romanchuk lost momentum there when he went for it. Can he get back? It's last year's winner, Marcel Hook. He's just found enough. It's going to be another course record for the Swiss athlete. Romanchuk took the risk, went for it, paid for it, and now has to finish in second place, as he did last year. Marcel Hug is the winner again, and perhaps that's a just victory for Hug, having led it pretty much gun to tape. But did he cut him off there, Tani? Was uh, that a gap for Romanchuk to go for? That wasn't a gap for Romanchuk to go for. In terms of the line he took, uh, Marcel Hug was was in front, and uh, he, uh, he he took a really fair line. I mean, Marcel is a very very gracious athlete. Uh, he might not be terribly happy with that because even though there's nothing in the rules to say you should have a you know an equal turn, it would be unusual at this level to sit behind and not do a scrap of work in, in terms of that race. So. I, I think that, from from what we saw, was was a fair turn and was a fair, um, you know, sprint for the finish line, and that's Paulo De Matt, uh, Marcel's coach. So they're, they're probably having a quite a balanced chat about what happens in the race. Now you see that that actually looked like Daniel also didn't take the turn. He didn't keep right. his hands on the steering. So there, Marcel's got go. a really straight line. That is totally fine. He's got a gap. And this is where Daniel decides to try and cut in on him. So he still doesn't have the line. That is still Marcel's line at that point. I'd take that as a fair turn. Actually, at that point, if Marcel had just grabbed his steering and just turned a little bit, 
he, he might have made that gap. Well, Romanchuk lost momentum. Uh, Hook himself did a little bit as well, but he, he picked up quicker and he, he just got back. Well got the speed back a little quicker than the American and then went away and uh, Romanchuk decided enough was enough about 100 meters out but it was a great race between the two and as i said uh, of course record will get that confirmed it was a course record last year and hoops gone even quicker this year so in the women's race catherine de brunner still leading uh, it doesn't look like it's going to be a close finish well it won't be a close finish first she's well over two minutes ahead of susanna scaroni of the USA and after winning in Berlin last week this will be another big victory for the Swiss athlete just a second marathon and she recovered really well from that turn but again you see as she's looking down you don't necessarily see all the bumps uh, and as an athlete she's quite light so she doesn't sort of always sort of take those bumps terribly well and and just behind her it looks like it's James Sembata who's from the University of Illinois they've not been pushing together at all through the race but they've been sort of neck and neck with each other but I mean this is a, a really strong race from Catherine today not just about the win but she, an incredible time for the London Marathon which is a really tough course So the embankment ahead, the curve of the River Thames, the sight of Big Ben in the distance, drawing you ever closer to the finish. There are a couple of rises here as you go underneath the underpasses, Blackfriars, and then not much really in terms of uh, an incline normally, but for the wheelchair athletes and for the elites and everybody else, just feel it a little bit because it's the closing miles. And it can be a little bit windy along there again, and especially with um, the disc wheels. Sometimes some of the lighter athletes will find they're blown a little bit across the road. And there was a while when there was kind of a real phase for going for deep rim front wheels. Um, they look nice. They might be great for bikes, but for chairs, they're, they're not particularly safe. But Catherine's pushing really well at the moment. She's, you know, keeping up a good average speed. Uh, slight, slight downhill now, but um, she's she's keeping up really good average speeds and is going to finish in a fast time. Well, this is going to be a close one for third, fourth, and fifth. That looks like Suzuki, I think, David Weir, and then Platt. Yes, it is. It is. These three have been together quite a while. So Suzuki leading them. Can David Weir come up with another third finish? He was third in Berlin last week and will be hoping that he can find some of that old sprinting speed. His 23rd London Marathon. Eight wins in those years. His first win was 20 years ago, 2002. Same year that Paula ran her first London Marathon. David Weir will so want to finish with a, a cheer here with the third place. Oh, just uh, watching Platt come around the other side. Doesn't really matter, it's a straight line down Birdcage Walk, but he's done it, oh, he's done it in the worst place. I was gonna say, it doesn't really matter. That was an error, Tani. I mean, actually, if one person who knows how to take this corner is David Weir, all his victories have come, just playing it absolutely right on that final turn. And he's just in the draft, and uh, Suzuki, and he's just waiting until you get that straight. And for, for Pats, that is, I mean, I was going to say rookie Eric, he is a rookie as a wheelchair athlete, even though, you know, he's won hand cycling and, and triathlon. And again, that's a really, not a great turn from, from the athletes there. But this is where David's got to really dig in. And uh, he's done it, that's it. Here he goes, Brilliant. David Weir, just getting a little bit of an advantage over Suzuki and David Weir just finds that little bit extra it's what london does to him it's what he does for london david weir takes third place clenches his fists that's two weeks in a row where he's managed to come in third fair way behind marcel hoog and daniel romancho but david weir will be delighted when you get into your 40s and you've done this so many times before to find the motivation to do it again and to hang in there and be good enough and strong enough and quick enough in the final meters to still fight for third place. So well done to him, Suzuki takes fourth, 
and Platt. It's a good performance from him in the, this sort of company, taking fifth place. Wasn't going to let that go, Tani, was he? You know, he, when he's in that position, you wouldn't bet against him in a sprint finish, whatever pack he's in. He just knows how to take that final turn. And, uh, you know, he started off as a sprinter back in Athens uh, in 2004, like everyone else moved his way up. And you can see that that means a huge amount to David Weir. Well, interesting in the men's race. It just looks like it's breaking up a little bit, we, mainly because the pace has uh, changed entirely. And uh, in the sense of uh, the, the forward at the front, one is meant to be hanging back because he, he is at the back in case two or three of these men drop off a little bit. But you can just feel there's a bit of a sense of things moving. I think it's probably because Emil Keras and Andy Butchart might not go too much further than this. I don't expect them necessarily to get certainly much beyond halfway if they make it a halfway but they look as though they're moving quite well just a little bit of not strain on some of the athletes but that group's just a little bit more spread out than it was and uh, our winner from last year Cisse Lemma the one perhaps is feeling it most yeah and he looks as though he has been for uh, much of this race so that may yet be deceptive but yes the pacemaker pacemaker three who had number 45 on his back his task is to essentially keep anybody company who drops off the back of this group um, and you've got the wall of three at the front with Emil Caress, Andy Butchard and Gogo who are um, set with the task they were actually asked to go 61 45 pace through halfway they're a little bit slower than that but they're doing a very good job of chatting to the guys behind them and just adjusting that pace according to what is wanted and what's going to produce i guess the best race uh, and serve these men racing uh, as well as possible so essentially all of the main protagonists that we were talking about Bikela interestingly hasn't really stepped away from that lead group of those going to complete the race uh, and seems to be the one most keen to, to keep the pace moving along you've got Kipruto on the other side of the road there and then keeping quiet as he usually does in the opening stages of the race Bashir Abdi in the yellow armbands further back crowds building out on the routes and men once they get to Tower Bridge, we'll see what we know will always be where so many people mass themselves. The women already through there, of course, through halfway. In fact, they're through 25k, the women. And one or two just dropping off that lead group. But it's Yohalu who's gone back to the front. And she's just bringing the pace back up again. And they're back within striking distance of the women's only world record there around 2.17.30 pace at the moment, but they've just picked it up a little bit. And I still think there are women there, 16.04, Paula just pointing for that five kilometer stretch. So pretty quick, will all of these women figure here because there are three or four in this group who will be heading for personal bests if they maintain this. So it's Yohalu they're all following. And then there's quite a big gap. Marion Goog is picked up a little bit as well, but she's now on her own, has no pacemaker. She does have Gebre Kidan, who's dropped off that pace, but she's uh, oh, almost a minute ahead of her, so she's going to have to keep an eye on... Well, if she, she'd be hoping to keep an eye, we'll be looking to see if any's come back to her, but there's a big gap between her and the rest. And that's a lonely part of the course as well, isn't it? So it's always a little bit quieter through here before they get back onto the highway. It is, it's lonelier and it's quieter, but it is still racing and there is still a buzz there. Uh, and Mary's actually very good at this as well, running on her own. She's, oh, they all spend a lot of time training like that. But some athletes can't keep themselves moving along when they find themselves in uh, no man or no woman's land, separated from other runners. But Mary is very good and pulled a lot of runners, or well, a fair few runners back, a lot of distance back in, in Boston when she ran so well there to do that. So she will start to see Gabrekadan up the road ahead of her and then hopefully be able to work her way forward as well from there and meanwhile it's definitely back to Yohalu dictating the pace here picked it up substantially uh, and asked questions of the other athletes there who at this stage with the exception of Kabrekadan were all able to respond and go with it so Yohalu Kabeda 
Bakiri, Magertu, all there with John Melly, Judith Career, and Joycelyn Jepkoskai. Meanwhile, on Birdcage Walk, here's the winner of the women's wheelchair, Tani. It's been a long, lonely race for Catherine de Bruyne, but she's done very well. She's had uh, an exceptional race. She broke Susanna Scaroni on Shooter's Hill and uh, just has increased the gap with every single kilometre. And from someone who's more used to racing track, I mean, she has done road racing, you know, being out on her own and being brave enough to take it, I think is a, a real test. And at the moment, she's still under course record pace. So not only in winning the London Marathon, but also if she manages to break Manuela Shah's course record, which is 139.52, that'll be an amazing day for her. And in all of the excitement of the men's race, Marcel broke the course record as well in uh, all the drama of the final turn. But now for Catherine, she knows that the race is there. She just needs to keep her head down and, uh, and keep working towards the finish line. I think just in the shot behind, I think that's Callum Hall, that they've been neck and neck. But for most of the race and once she takes this final turn this is where you're going to be seeing the sprinter in her even though she knows she's well clear she is going to want to be looking uh, at the clock and every of the each one of the athletes has onboard computers they'll know their average speed their top speed uh, they'll have a gps on it and she will be looking uh, as she makes that final turn to be going for for the course record it's where she just starts trying to pick it up a look it's a long long time out on your own uh, as a sprinter. Well, she could be heading for a course record as well and she can just keep this going. She's got a chance. The course record set last year was 139.52 and you can see the clock just ticking away there. But what a day for Catherine de Bruyne being cheered by the crowd here after a surprise win against Manuela Schaar in Berlin last week. And it was a sprint finish, this time completely different, all on her own. Catherine de Brunner of Switzerland wins the women's wheelchair race, London 2022. And that looks like a new course record as well for her. Great performance, showing that the marathon is a distance and is an event that she can cope with marvellously well. It would have been great to have seen her against Manuela Shah and Madison de Rosario today. Sadly, those two had to pull out with illness uh, overnight. But that didn't matter for De Bruyne. She performed sensationally today. Had to do it by herself, though, Tani. And it's really hard when you're out there on your own. And, you know, she wouldn't have, have known the course. They would have driven it several times. But it's very different driving it to, to actually being on it. And, uh, a little smile there as she crossed the finish line. You know, she's beaten some really good athletes today and, uh, you know, going into the rest of the major series when, uh, you know, Maddie will want to be defending a New York title and Manuela will want to be coming back. This is just the, the start of what could be an incredible career for Catherine de Bruyne. Well, there are the two winners. It's a Switzerland double victory as it was last year. Marcel Hoog part of that on both occasions but this year instead of Manuela Schaar it's Catherine de Bruyne who makes it a great day for Swiss wheelchair racing again well I hesitate to say this I can see white fluffy clouds overhead and may even get a hint of sunshine a little bit later on who knows but it's certainly been a lovely day for a racing the rain held off and back in Greenwich Park, down the river from where we are. They are still being assembled and taken out towards the familiar site of the gates at the end of the park, which will set them on their way. A couple of thousand in each wave. Gives them plenty of chance to spread out on the road and be able, doesn't matter what pace you're going, you can, you're not gonna get dragged along quicker than you want to. Mr. Is there a Mr. Sparky? Or has he just made that up? He's a spark plug, isn't he? Well, I know he's a spark plug, but you know, like the Mr. Men and things like that. No, never mind. He can help people get started again if they can't get stuck in the race. You're electric today, you, aren't you, eh? Don't laugh at your own jokes, by the way. She's gone. She's corpsing now. So these folks, uh, including Mr. Sparky, are 
on their way. And now the next group will get going. This is Susanna Scaroni of the USA in second place in the women's wheelchair. She was close last week, but not this week, Tani. Do you know, Scaroni's had uh, an incredible career. She trains at the University of Illinois. They have, uh, you know, a massive team there. She's won LA twice, but she's got so many second and third places in marathons. She's never broken into sort of the, the major series. And uh, 5,000 meter uh, Paralympic champion on the start line of the 1500 in Tokyo, she dropped her glove. I mean, we call them gloves, they basically just cover your fingers. So in, in last year and early this year, she's been in great form, but uh, while she gets second place, she probably also would have been expected to be a, a little bit closer to Catherine De Brunner today. This is a tough final climb. It just shows that it's a very slight uphill. It's, it's not a pleasant sprint, whatever point you are in the race. <laughs> Uh, she's done well though, so second place. Just uh, what, 142.20 there, thereabouts. New finish uh, gantry, you might have been noticing this year. You can actually stand on top and watch so those who are privileged and important enough to do so if they want to. And a little later on, there will be the welcome site for 40,000 others. But for now, We'll leave Susanna Scaroni and her congratulations in finishing in second place. So back in the men's race, well, Andy Butchart, who was helping pace at the front, has dropped back to the second group. He's helping pace the uh, chase group. Emil Keres is still there, but this looks as though they're being asked to push on. There is Andy Butchart with the second group, including uh, uh, Robinson of the uh, USA, Wayne Gebrselassie for Great Britain. The Shetterson Harrier looking comfortable, looking good. Mark Scott just uh, checking, moving them across to avoid the island in the middle of the road. So the two British men doing a good job. And Gabriel Selassie, well, he's on a pretty good pace at the moment. He's actually running under 2.10 pace. He's going pretty quick. So just hope that that's good pace judgment for him. And at the front, they're under 2.5 pace. So, another Gabriel Selassie at the front. And Kenanisa Bekele. I think, you know, the, the, everyone's been saying, you know, Kenanisa, what, what are we going to expect? You know, since 2019, when he ran that second fastest time ever, it's been a difficult period. I think this is only about his fourth race in that period. But he looked OK in the Great North Run for me, looked good. And the, apparently the guys are saying that, you know, the last 10 weeks or so, he's put in some good work, some good training. Keeping him fit, not injured, is the key. Of course it is. He's 40. That's what you're, you're usually fighting your body more than anything else. So it's good to see Kananisa Bekele, you know, right up there and enjoying this race at this point. Still early stages, but it's great to see him there. And leading it and dictating it for so much of it. And that, I think, is the contrast to the way in which he ran the Great North Run. Um, and perhaps shows that in that short period of time from the Great North Run to this race, he's actually come on in terms of how he feels psychologically as well as the physical shape that he's in. And you're right, the hardest battle is keeping yourself healthy and avoiding those injuries but staying in good enough shape to race and when he's been able to do that he's still been able to come out and produce a very good performance so nobody in that lead group will be writing him off and certainly not the way the first part of this race has panned out he's shown that he's somebody to be watched today yes you say lemma last year's winner at the back of the group just look at his watch i always think of the early stages here unless you can see a benchmark looking at your watch is a is it's a distraction that the guys at the front won't be doing. You know, you, your mind is wandering. Uh, so, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how long he stays with, with that group. In the women's race, Paul, I think the really interesting thing is we've seen Kabeda be the one to try and push things at the front. You can see Johalo is at the back of this group. And Jack Koskai and Korea are the two following Kabeda. Joan Melli, who ran so well, winning in Seoul. Recently, big personal best for her, trying to hang on, looks as though she's working hard, but Yohalo is just trying to tuck in behind her as well. But again, another one looking at her watch, but it's Kabeda who's pushing this on. 
It is, and when they'd already picked it up to a 16.04 5K, you get the impression this has picked up even more. Kibeda there checking her watch. That's not a sign of weakness. That is her trying to execute a race plan, trying to break this field, and there are gaps starting to open up there. There is a gap opening back to Becerra, who has looked good <clears throat> so far in this race. Uh, and now Korea eyes down. She's just focusing on the heels of Kibeda ahead. They're almost in single file they are slotting now into single file but just that weaving across the road either she's going for a drinks bottle or she's now decided oh, that's enough of my go at the front for now somebody else needs to come through and take that on and i think that's what she's trying to do she's looking for any takers to take up the pace uh, and to kind of maintain the turning of the screw that she'd started a big group coming into the mall now Well, here we have the uh, rest of the women coming in, Tani. So this is going to be really tight to call on this one. So we've got places third to tenth. We've got Wakeko Toshido. That is Eden Rainbow Cooper at the front. And she has had an amazing year. First marathon Paris, she came second in the Commonwealth Games. And she's going to get third in the London Marathon. She's beaten some incredible athletes who are coming with her in that pack. And huge celebration from Eden there. Yeah, well, time finish. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, we saw a lot of the Commons games, didn't we? And uh, what a great performance from her there. And another one here. There was a big pack there that obviously stayed together for most of the race. But right at the end, she manages to come through for the bronze medal. And, you know, we, we've talked, Tani, about how much this uh, prize money has made a difference. You know, winning, getting on the podium, in one of the majors is a, is a is a good day for the what are now professional athletes and that's a uh, with david weir the two of them uh, will be celebrating today it's a amazing day for eden uh, rainbow cooper there you know she did the first marathon in paris uh, and then got to say commonwealth games and for her you know she's not yet on um the gb funding so actually trying to be able to get round and do all the races by coming third year, it means she then gets invited to all the other races, which will then, you know, uh, help her take that next step up. Well, congratulations to the pair of them, two very good third places. Uh, the women have just come back together again. The Cabeda had been moving pace on, but Kara looked as though she might drop off the pace. And now we're seeing Gebri Kidan being uh, run down by Mary and Googie. The first who dropped off that lead group. She's been reeled in. Mary and Googie will be hoping that uh, two, three of the others ahead of her, the same sort of thing happens. So this is about a minute and a half behind the leaders. They're thereabouts. But that lead group's still a big group. And John Melly just starting to go to the front of it. But for the men, the familiar sight of Tower Bridge and the great crowds here. Kennedy Sibakili. One of the greatest runners of all time behind the pacemakers leading this 59 12 through 20k so the pace being maintained uh, and lemma for the first time has moved himself up from that back spot in this race and getting himself into a bit more contention as they're all lifted by the noise and the ambience as they come over tower bridge and approach there the halfway mark which will give us the exact Halfway split. No, no, sorry, that's not the halfway mark. That's coming off the bridge. Yeah, once they get over the bridge, yeah, Paula, so they get 20k with you. Know, it's, it's I know, I'm getting one, a bit ahead. It's, it's around the corner. <laughs> it's, it's around the corner, yeah. So this is the chase group, and what a good run so far from Wendy Gebris. I mean, we have seen him go out hard, but he ran 2.12 recently, and I think that was a real confidence booster for him. He's in great form, he's been running well for the last 12 months or so. so he looks a little bit more tired to me, though, than when we saw him a few minutes back, maybe a mile or two back, looking for his drink. Got it. But he looks tired. He does. It is a little bit of a pull as well, as you can see from that long shot. Uh, not significant, but an incline, certainly, as they go up over Tower Bridge, crest it, and then come down into what psychologically feels like a, a downhill, doesn't it? Second half is always a bit downhill, even though it's the hardest section of the race. If you've paced it right, you are coming closer and closer to the finish. The crowds are building more and more. So if you can just maintain focus through this next bit, he's on for a, a good run. Those gaps are starting to open up. And the danger is, though, that he then gets 
detached back. If he gets detached from the pacemakers, fair enough, but if he can stay in contact with Goddard of Australia there, that would be a good place to be in a duo working together. So the second group coming across Tower Bridge with the familiar pacemakers, Mark Scott and Andy Butchart doing a good job here. When they gave us the follow saying, just going to have to be smart here. I just wonder whether one of the guys might, you know, they've got a job to do for uh, Robinson. And, uh, God, I just wonder whether one of them might drop back and, and uh, realise that Gabriel Salas is maybe just going through a bit of a patch here and trying to help. So there we go with the pace, the last mile, 4.42. So it's warming up, isn't it? It's definitely warming up from an already quick pace. It, it's lifted uh, a little bit more. Still, Vakeli is the one who's keen to, to keep the pacemakers moving on. And Emil Caress is doing a great job in sticking with this. I'm not sure how much further he's going to go there. He's getting some indication from Go Go Pace number two on his vest uh, and yeah there we see Mio Caress done a good job pacing that group uh, and now it's down to one at the front and one who will keep company anybody who drops off this main group now. I'm enjoying you know, seeing Kenanisa Bikeli you know, at the front dictating matters. Yeah, meanwhile back in uh, Greenwich Park the next Group ready to go, the next wave. So many uh, costumes. I was watching a piece, uh, there's uh, Big Ben out there again, isn't there? British Heart Foundation, the charity that is the official charity of the London Marathon this year. Does anyone know anyone called Matt? So Cuddy Sark will uh, be pretty much filled now. I mean, the, the, gradually the whole route will be filled from it's a, the elite men are heading them towards the finish, but it will back up behind them and these scenes will be repeated all the way down the course. Great crowd to Cuddy Sark. Uh, one of the reasons is you can get back over onto the other side of the river as well if you do get a chance to spot your loved one. You can get over and see them there sometime later in the race at around about 18 miles, 17, 18 miles there, thereabouts. Crossing points are, uh, are, are, you see the operation there. <laughs> they take people into the middle and then eventually they'll move the runners on the other side of the road and allow those to cross on the other section. Never ever fails to inspire, does it, to see so many people with all of their own reasons to come and take part. For some, the first time, some have been here on so many occasions. Come from all around the world, all around the UK, to come and enjoy this unique atmosphere, this unique event. So as we just watch all of these great runners coming through and the inevitable Rhino, we can now have a little look at what's going on at the front with the elite women. It's been interesting, this race. It really hasn't so it's set fire. It's quick, it's fast. The women in this group are still running close to their personal best. But these are all looking now, all seven of them, thinking about winning this. Joss and Jeff Koskai, for the first time, really, the champion from last year and it was at 22 miles last year where she broke away and look at that 538 mile that's a slow mile uh, given what they were doing earlier on and that's because they're gathering the, the time's slipping now they're forgetting about the time they're now thinking about how to win the race Absolutely, this is now a race uh, and that's why I think you see Jocelyn Jepkoskaya make her way to the front just to make her presence known. Okay, I, I've kept quiet at the back all the time the pace was pushing. Now I'm still here, I'm still okay, I'm another one that needs to be 
factored into to that thinking, and that's why we're seeing the slowing. These women now are trying to assess uh, and reevaluate a little bit the race plan in their heads, which had been Yohalo going out so fast uh, and then essentially holding on. Oh, that's oh we had a fall there. That, that was Yohalo. It was, it was one of those uh, sleeping policemen, the, the humps in the road that we've talked about, and she uh, just it fell, Paula, just as you're been, talking. It may also have been a slip on the blue uh, bike marker that you see. Jeff Koskai was running with water, and she tipped a bit down herself, and I just wonder if that wet that surface a little bit. Uh, and Johala's running at the back, so she had no idea that was happening, and that may have been what happened there she was up and running again very quickly uh, we'll get an indication if we get a look at her running form if she hit the ground hard enough to do any damage the best thing to do of course is get up and run again as quickly as possible that's usually the advice for a, a twisted ankle rather than hitting yourself on the floor let's just have a look here she's right at the back i think she just didn't see it paul i don't yeah. think it's, no, it's one she of the just, bumps You're it's right. one of the bumps right in the middle of the road and i don't think she saw it uh, she was in the gap sorry in the group there at the back Anyway, back up and running, and straight uh, back on the pack, on the back of the pack. So, uh, Magurto, her teammate, had a little look to check she was okay. She was. So we've got seven women here. Big gap to uh, Marion Googie is chasing, but it's best part of two minutes. And uh, these seven women, as I said, have, I think starting to forget about. Any women's only world records, Yahalo must have decided, no, that's not going to happen for me today. In fact, she's probably not even going to run as quick as she did in her debut marathon if uh, they continue to stay slow through this section. And I just wonder whether Jeb Koskai is going to replay in her head what happened last year. There was a group for such a long time last year, she was the one who gradually broke it up because they were all waiting for Bridget Koskai, weren't they, last year to do something, didn't do anything, and it was Jeb Koskai who took it on. And it is, it's an interesting factor, I think, when they come in with such a big pre-race favourite, and there's been a lot of talk about how fast it's going to go, or when you're racing the world record holder in Bridget Koskai, you have to have your own plan in place as well, and you have to trust your instincts. Uh, and that's what Jocelyn Jeb Koskai is actually very good at. So she kicked at, what, about 22 miles last year. Um, she felt like that was the time to go for her. She tuned into that instinct, uh, and it turned out to serve her very well in the end. So these women have to be capable and in shape to run very fast times, but they also have to be able to race and to race cleverly with what their body is capable of doing on the day and that's why i think we're seeing a gathering now because they're all reassessing okay what would be in my best interest now when would be the best time for me to attack am i going to wait and leave it really late or am i going to try and throw in surges and we'll probably see a number of surges career it looks as though now who, who's starting to try and lift the pace a little bit and she may work together with jeb costco because as you mentioned earlier they do get on very well This is Marion Gugu, who's best part of two minutes behind. She's still running strongly enough, but uh, by her own race plan, which was to try and run well under 2.20. She's uh, slipped out that sort of time. The women at the front have slowed, but uh, Mary has slowed as well. So despite catching Gebre Kidan, not able to make any inroads into the lead group here. So these seven with the Olympic Excuse me, the world silver medalist Judith Career alongside the winner from last year, Joyce and Jep Koskai, the two Kenyans now dictating matters. Well, we've still got good pace being set, a decent pace, sub 2 5 pace being set. For the first time, Bashir Abdi a little closer to the front, and Kenanisa Bekele. Well, you and I were talking beforehand, we were like, if Kenny's still at 25k, and we're approaching that. Uh, just we're hoping that maybe he could stay involved. But uh, looks a little under pressure at this point. Kennedy Sabakele, Bashar Abdi, and uh, Kip Ruto, the two men who I think most thought would be perhaps the two to really dictate matters here. Well, they're looking good, as is Gabriel Selassie at the, just on the heels, almost clipping the heels of the pacemaker here. Just a little bit of info, they did end up going through halfway in 62-14, so about 30 seconds down 
are on the pace that have been talked about pre-race, but certainly panning into a very good race now, and I'm sure we're going to see a uh, big negative split in this men's race here today. Yeah, it's set up for that, isn't it? You know, and I think there's uh, enough talent, enough ability for that to happen. 62-14, and still pretty quick through halfway. So even if it wasn't a negative split, we'd still be going the 2-4 range, which isn't bad at all. And this is Wayne Gebre Selassie, which is great to see. He's just got a, a runner there, Brett Robinson, to tag on to with a pacemaker as well. We don't have Butchard or KRS anymore. I think they've stopped, which was expected. But if uh, Gebre Selassie can get through this period of the race, well, that'll be great for him. So we've just lost Joan Melli, who's just dropped off that lead group. The Romanian, former Kenyan, now running for Romania, is now 15, 20 metres off the back. So perhaps Korea and Jeff Koskai, like last year, sensing with uh, around four miles to go there, thereabouts, that now is the time to push it. Bekere dropping off as well. She looked as though she was going to drop a little while back until they slowed. So they're going to have to work hard to keep going in these uh, the last 10k or more but now the race is on you feel at the front definitely uh, and this is what we expected to see come into play perhaps a little earlier more women dropping off from this lead group but finally the work is starting to pay off for Judith Korea and Jocelyn Jepkoskai who picked up the pace tried to work together a little bit and each time you sense or you hear that somebody is dropping away from the back that is encouraging when you're at the front eyes focused as Jocelyn Jepkoskai uh, and Judith Korea are in terms of trying to break this group and work away a little bit and you see Kabeda is she's struggling and moving across the side of the road just to get a little bit out of eye shot. She may be the next person to go. So I guess they're hoping Johanna will be one of those that drops off. But for the moment, she seems to have recovered OK from that slip and is settled into the slipstream of Mugertu and Korea behind. And you can see now Korea not too happy with how close they are running to her. The Ethiopian runners in general, of course, spend a lot of time running on single file trails through the forest high up above Addis Ababa and that's why very often in races you will see them just slot in behind and kind of relax into that zone of just focusing on the feet of the runner in front of you. From that overhead shot you see how quickly they do drop off. Once you can't stay with it anymore these women are dropping quickly off back down the road in terms of pace so perhaps they can work together um, there but I'm not sure and this is where it starts to come into play for Marion Guga if she can start to see the runners up the road ahead of her and can she start to reel some of those in yeah they're all starting to fall away but she's uh, actually through 30k points uh, it'd be interesting to see at 35 whether or not she'd uh, caught up any ground but it's about the women at the front here trying to push this on and for Jeff Koskai, I think she's looking really comfortable. I mean, and remember that Judith's career was not meant to be running the marathon here. She was meant to be pacemaking. And actually in the press conference on Wednesday, she looked as though she wasn't too happy about that. You know, she kind of said, I haven't prepared for a full marathon. But you had to be in shape. And I think she was going to run a marathon later in the autumn. So training must have been going well enough. And with one or two of the uh, other dropouts, like uh, Bridget Koskai dropped out a couple of weeks ago, so her career was brought in, asked to continue, and she's doing a brilliant job. So the world silver medalist leading with last year's winner, Jeb Koskai. Now it's down to four, Yohalo and Magertu, the two Ethiopians hanging on, and the others are dropping away. So I make that 5K 16.38. So there's, they've slowed in those subsequent 5Ks coming off Tower Bridge from the 16.04, 16.23, 16.38, which given that the, the screw was being turned in Korea and Jeff Costco were trying to do damage and have succeeded in, in doing damage to some of the women in that pack and breaking it up and whittling it down to a group of four, that indicates that these are women running on tired legs. Um, even when they're picking up, they're not touching the pace that they were running at in the opening stages of that so undoubtedly some more surges still to come we will see some faster 5ks as they certainly fast faster kilometer splits 
as they try and break up this group but it, it now does become a true marathon race in terms of who can mitigate the damage done to their legs by the hard running in the opening stages uh, as well as possible and cope with it through this race uh, John Melly has uh, just passed I think that's Bikeri uh, Kabeda a little further ahead still a good 20 odd minutes of running for these women and uh, <laughs> you can lose a lot of ground but Joanne Melly just looks as though she's rallied a little bit which is uh, trying to hang on perhaps maybe keep an eye on Kabeda ahead trying to head for a top six finish the men by contrast look as though they've just bunched up together again a little bit Kabeda uh, excuse me <laughs> the Kelly at the back of the group there just checking his watch Bashir Abdi looking nice and comfortable Kibruto looks good as well Gabriel Selassie looking uh, comfortable though. Winner from last year, Cissé Lemma, over on the far side. You can't quite see him, just being hidden by his teammate, uh, Legese. But he's in the, there uh, you can see him now, just looking across, still there. Still there, and for me, looking better and better yes. as this race goes on. Uh, in slight contrast to Kenanisa Bekele, who I think is starting to certainly go to that concentration zone in his mind uh, where you're trying to zone out the the pain and the things that are hurting uh, as much as possible and just focus on the race plan and focus on the race and, and where you are right now yeah, yeah. Gabriel Selassie looking good Kipruto looking good Bashir Abdi always has a little bit of that frown on his face I don't think there's anything to to read into that he's leading and looking strong at the moment well, this is Wayne Gabriel Selassie is leading in the British race, but he's now looking as though he's not able to stay with uh, Robinson and will now have to try and you know, concentrate. He's gone out quick. He went out very quick, sub 210 pace. There is Robinson still with some help from the pacemaker, which would be great for him. Gabriel Selassie's in ninth place at the moment and uh, had been running pretty quick through 25k in fact was it had slipped inside 29 pace so that really was ambitious so the hope for him now is that he can stay strong in the second half of the race that's going to be a tall ask and then we'll be keeping an eye on uh, those chasing behind because undoubtedly there'll be others who feel as though they've got a chance to run people who've gone a bit quick early on Phil Sesselman back in 11th place and wasn't too far behind. We're not really seeing him. Uh, we have uh, only got so many cameras, but Phil Sesselman isn't too far behind and is currently running sub 210 pace as well. And he's in a pack as well. He's running with Yuan Koala of France, who's actually making his debut. So, European steeplechase champion back in. 2014. He's moving up to the marathon and he's running together with Phil Sessman, so that's great. Yeah, more people streaming through here. Yeah, Kuti Saka, such a favourite place for the spectators and it gives everybody a lift as they come through. And the spectators, I uh, hope they stay and uh, their job is a tough one as well, you know, you've got to bring your flasks and your sandwiches and plan where you're going to watch you're going to be out there for a good few hours i hope they manage to do that and cheer as many people on as they can thankfully the weather has stayed pretty good and uh, you can see there the pace is 345 for this pace there'll be a different pace with each of the waves they've kind of tried to break them up a little bit in terms of what they expect them to do but generally speaking within each wave there'll be people going a little bit quicker than others they're not all running the same time in each wave 40,000 or so we're expecting to have registered by yesterday. Whether they all show up this morning. There's always a few, you know, who register. You know, come to, you have to pick up your number at the running show. It means you're in London, you've picked up your number, and then they don't make the start line. Well, I've been in there, a lot of forests around the UK lately, seeing the Gruffalo Trail. And that's where, that's the one they've been looking for. That's where he is. All the little kids in the forest around the UK, they say, go and find the Gruffalo. He's in London. Oh, there's a runner for raising funds for Well Child and the highlighting all of the great work that's gone in. 
in the NHS and in other areas of medicine in the last few years. Right, in the women's race, let's go back and have a look what's going on there because uh, Yohalo has moved herself up to the front. Judith Career, all of a sudden, is starting to struggle. It's Jeff Koskai and Yohalo who now are running side by side, and McGurtu is trying to hang on as well. Be great if she could stay with these two for as long as possible, but these were the two we thought would contest the race. Yohalo has been really quiet for the last 10k or so, kept away from the lead. Jeff Koskai probably thought, yeah, I might have you here, but that's a 5.11 mile, the previous one. That's pretty darn quick. And now all of a sudden they're dropping down. They've passed the Tower of London and they're dropping down onto the embankment for real, if you like. A couple of bridges to go under here, but the race is on now. Race is definitely on, and that hurts when the pace picks up that much at this stage. So they've settled into around about... 218 pace which is what probably about 514 pace so then picking up to to 511 from what was a slower mile because they'd started quickly if that makes sense they've eased off and then kicked from there and the only one who was able to really respond to that is jocelyn jepkoska and she now now knows she's in a real race here and you can see almost a gritting of her teeth though she's trying to stay with it she's trying to run alongside her and not yet you have get ahead but she has to now seed ground and drop in behind and she will now try to hang on for as long as possible well there you can see what the damage has done and this is always like i'm just surprised it took this long i thought these two uh, it, it was very obvious that johano at some point around about halfway decided that, that she wasn't feeling good enough to really go for the fast time and then we've had this period where they've settled start to think about the race and this is her trying to win the race now this isn't chasing a time this is thinking right i'm close enough to the finish i feel good enough i can pick the pace up and i can maintain this through to the finish from here and it's still not out of her reach to to take that women's only uh, world record uh, as well today. She's on to 18 pace, but the pace that she's picked it up to now is very quick. Uh, and there is still what, at least 15 minutes of running to go in this race now. And you can see Jocelyn Jepkoska has had to make that decision. Oh, well, the decision essentially has been made for her because she hasn't been able to stick with the surge in pace. And she's still running strongly. She's still... I think fairly safe if she can maintain this in that second place, but certainly Yohalo is eyes down, just focused on the road ahead of her and just looking for each mile marker in turn now and trying to pour everything that she was saving up in that st stage of the race where it just settled down a little bit into making this a long, fast run for home. She's still checking her watch. Well, I think she should just get her head down now and, uh, you know, force the issue because uh, if she's feeling good enough and she gets a big enough gap, Jeb Koskai, I wouldn't think we'll be able to come back from that. And she's made an effort to go with her. She herself may suffer because these two perhaps could work together if Jeb Koskai really does tie. You know, sometimes the effort to go with the leader, you commit yourself, you've still got a couple of miles, or two, three miles or so to go. But Korea can still see her teammate so last year's winner is having a little look behind to see how far away the chase could be on. They're not far behind her as she watches Yohalo disappear. Well, this is the woman, just 23 years of age, that her training camp, her team, think is so good. She has won the half marathon in Antrim. In fact, last year when she won it, she thought she'd broken the world record, but uh, was it last year, the year before? And it was measured short, 54 metres short, sadly for her. But she then, this year, ran the fastest ever debut marathon, 2.17.23 when she won in Hamburg. Is uh, She's a kind of a, jumped straight to the marathon in road racing, hasn't she? Uh, Richard Naroka, one of our top marathon runners who still spends a lot of time in Ethiopia, knows them well, was telling me the other day that she was kind of in their academy from 15 to 19 and the new was pointless pushing her onto the track that was always going to be the road race setup that was for her and she's moved into it really nicely over the last two or three years and was patient enough before she moved up to the marathon you've got to you've got to really just you know not, not get you know, 20 21 maybe a bit young even 23 you could argue is quite young but she's got all of the pedigree 
looks good. She does, and she does, of course, have that shorter race speed as well over the half marathon and 10K, and she's using that now. And that look of concentration on her face has changed a little bit. There's certainly more focus in it now, I, I think, and she's really, really driving on now. It, I think it will have smarted, but wow, a 4.43 miles. So I said she was going after that, and, and she certainly is pouring it all on. That's why the damage has been done further back. And a lot of these women, of course, are still on personal best pace for, not quite for Jep Koska, although she may be reaching out towards that, but certainly for Magertu and for Korea, they are on for personal best pace and they will be chasing that as well. But really no question about the woman who's going to win this race. The question is just about how fast she is going to run. Uh, she decided mid-race not to put the surge on all the way for the uh, Ethiopian record, which we thought she might do, and conditions were perhaps conducive to being able to do that today, but she didn't feel it, so she judged her race really well in terms of just sitting in, settling back, and gathering for this final drive to the finish. Well, she looks to be serenely on her way to a big, big victory. However, in the men's race, they're all still waiting. Still running a pretty good pace, still inside two hours five. But everybody there that we would expect to be there, Bashir Abdi with the yellow arm sleeves, the Olympic bronze medalist, the world bronze medalist, coached by Gary Locke, trains with Mo Farah. And then we've got Kip Ruto, just the Kenyan, who they'll all be hoping he can fly the flag for them because uh, they don't really have anybody else in the race this year after recent withdrawals. This is his first ever London Marathon, so maybe he's going to be patient and wait and see. Perhaps we'll not see him come in. He doesn't know the course so well, doesn't know the last few miles. Uh, Kindia Tano is still there as well, who is another 2-3 runner. His first London Marathon just uh, tucked in behind Kipruto, but Kenanisa Bekele at the back of the group. They haven't got rid of him. Still hanging in there. He is at each kilometre, I think, that he manages to, to stay in there. That will be good for him. That will be good for his psyche that he's still in this race and they've not got away from him yet. And he will be glad that this is panning out into slightly more, I can't believe we're saying a tactical race when they're still on 2-4 pace. Um, but it does seem to be a little bit more looking around and certainly people making the right judgments to try and win this race rather than to try and go after course records uh, and fast times. This is always, I think, a bit of the course where you just need to concentrate. You know, you've got all these turns and twists and you know, you're not really on back onto that stretch where you get back on the highway and you know you're heading for home, and, but things can happen. And there we see the last pacemaker, sorry, the penultimate pacemaker dropping out and they're through 30K, 128.49. That's been a slow section there, Paula. That's 15.08, it's the slowest five kilometer section of the race. Yeah, which followed on from what I made of 14.31. So they certainly surged uh, and then they have slowed back down uh, and gathered. And uh, I think it's an indication that racing's happening. And we saw the two pacemakers start to pick up the pace. I think that was because they were trying to hit their target through that split. Uh, and now the real racing opens up and we see who's willing to, to take on the lead. And it's for the moment. Kip Ruto was also fairly quick to get himself up there into position. Gebre Selassie has been sitting in a, in a good position so far uh, and he maintains that so he almost is now those three across the road and settling behind them and Bekele is still there, Cecil Emma is still there. Well, the guess here, obviously putting a little bit of pace on there. Let's just check in with what's happening with the women because it looks as though Johanna, well, it, it doesn't look as though she is storming away, looking very strong, will be approaching 40 kilometers very soon. And that women's only world record of 217.01, I don't think really is within her grasp, despite how quickly she's going. 210.21, she's going very, very quick. And that 
when it comes up, she'll still be right, dropped it down to 217.30. She'd have to run an incredible last 2K. She's running fast, Paula, but you know that to pick up 30 seconds in 2K. I still think uh, the one thing I will say in that half marathon, she ran 255 for the last kilometer. If she ran, if she did something like that, she'd have half a chance. I think she's capable of it. I think the deciding factor is going to be the already fast pace that she's put into this point. So had she kicked from here, she's undoubtedly capable of running that last 2.2 kilometers in time to get under that record. But the fact that she's pushed all the way along the embankment will make it harder. She is out on her own. She is winning the race. She is probably going to run a personal best, I think. So I think she will be chasing those at the moment. But there we go. 5.16, so that slipped a little bit. She would need to be running under the 5.10s, I think, to have a chance of getting close to that so her next thing to look out for now is my mile to go red telephone box coming up and that will be the sign that might even be it she's just gone past there and then she will be eyes fixed ahead looking for big ben 1200 meters to go and trying to tick off those markers uh, and count down into the finish. She's really in her own zone, isn't she? Just focused on her own race and what she can draw out of what is a, a tired body that's screaming at her at this point. Well, we'll be back with her shortly. We're just checking with the men just to quickly see what's happening there because they are making moves as well, but uh, I guess it's just slowed again. So maybe the men just waiting, being a bit patient. Gabriel Selassie is there, Atano is there, Abdi in the group, Bashir Abdi, uh, Cecil Lemma, the defending champion, Kenny Sibikele at the back, and the one Kenyan in the group here, Amos Kipruto. So they will pick up, I'm pretty sure. And there's Gabriel Selassie deciding, I don't want this to go slow for too long. And all of a sudden, He's starting to force things as a little bit of a surprise that he might be the man to do it. But when it's your day, it's your day. So he's decided, I feel good. And uh, just trying to push things on, Kaputo immediately follows. There we go. As the pace hots up, a little bit of sunshine coming out. For the first time, there are shadows from the men uh, across the roads uh, and sun breaking through, certainly here on the Mall uh, and temperatures warming up a little bit as Gabriel Selassie's definitely threw in a surge there now, but seems to have settled down again to see if anybody else wants to take it up uh, and maintain it. And no, they're just spread across the road. So as we leave the men, Yahalo has come into Parliament Square through there. Big Ben now behind her, watching over the winner as she will be of this year's London Marathon. Yahalo will be heading for a pretty quick time, and uh, she'll probably now be more thinking about her own personal best rather than that women's only world record, which I think is just too much of a stretch at this point. And she ran 217.23 in her first ever marathon in Hamburg earlier this year. Moved to Addis Ababa about seven years ago. And she uh, knows English conditions, particularly because of those races she's had in Antrim, I guess. So was well prepared for coming to London. But it's been a canny race that, that she's run, Paula. You know, it was smart enough not to keep the force on early on when she perhaps wasn't feeling it just stayed quiet for a period until she felt ready to strike and then she's done that with great effect yeah, and I think that is the marker of a great athlete when you're not feeling 100% in the race and you have to modify and change your race plan from the way you'd set it out and to still be able to, to come away with a victory and finishing as strongly as she is. I think she's underlining that she might not be regaining that Ethiopian record, she might not be taking the, the women's world record, but she still is absolutely a racer to be reckoned with, as is Jocelyn Jepkoskai, who came in with question marks she was only seventh in boston earlier this year and she's building herself back in but she's still put out a good defense of her title here today a little look over her shoulder but i don't think she's in danger she's very tired but i don't think she's in danger for that second place 
So, Yohalo, this 23-year-old sensation from Ethiopia, I'm sure we're going to see a lot more of her in coming years. Who knows at the major championships as well, because Ethiopia will want to find somebody who can lift the gold medals as well as the big city majors. I think at one point she was going to race in China for her next marathon after a race in Hamburg, but she then was, as you'd expect, <laughs> persuaded that London is the place you want to be. This is where all the best runners come. This is where the world's greatest have come and won. And she has got a lot to do in her career yet, but this is a great start in a world marathon major career for Yalamzerf Yohalo of Ethiopia. Long, long way ahead now as she comes in front of Buckingham Palace and then we'll turn into the mile. Her first name apparently translates to edge of the world. Well, she's on top of the world at the moment because this will be the biggest day of her racing career. Yalanzerf heads into the home straight. She'll see that Finnish country. She's never been down this road before, but it's maybe a path that she's going to tread many times coming up in the years ahead in her career because she is a super talent. Yalanzerf Yohalo being cheered to the line. The clock has gone past that women's only world record. She's very, very close to her personal best. 2.17.23. She might just miss it by a second or two, which would be a shame. I don't think she's going to mind about that. She's the champion in London in 2022. Yahalo is the winner. Great performance. We'll get the official time. Maybe just missed her personal best by two or three seconds. But that won't matter to her. It was the victory which was the most important thing. And she, when she made that move with about four miles to go, it was a decisive move. And Jep Koskai did well. It was at that point last year that she managed to pull away from everybody else, but not this time. The Harlow just too good. But you have to say that Jep Koskai has put up an excellent defence. And she will run her second fastest at marathon and finish in second place in London in 2022. So we're waiting for the third place after it is McGurtu who's managed to pull away from Judith career so McGurtu will be heading for a personal best herself 218.51 before she came into this that was set uh, last year actually no in Seville this year excuse me so a new personal best for her third in London very tired and Judith career the world silver medalist I think we'll be pretty happy with that coming in fourth place when she originally was only going to come here as the pacemaker. Well done, her. Yeah, great run, and only, what, 23 seconds or so outside of that personal best that she set for the silver medal in Eugene. So to turn it around uh, and come back so quickly for such a high-caliber marathon is great racing from her, but great racing from this woman. She modified the race plan that everybody was talking about. Perhaps it was always her race plan in her head, but certainly a very decisive victory when she decided to really turn the screw. Uh, she moved away with ease. Well, let's just have a little look back at those who uh, just come round Cuddy Sark. They're just, uh, these athletes are kind of moving away from Cuddy Sark. You can see the other famous ship, the Gypsy Moth. Uh, commemorated in that club, which I'm sure is doing pretty good business this morning. Lots of messages out there. So many people running. We'll be given a, a few mentions as we go through the morning. And uh, don't forget to send us your text. Is that Richard Whitehead down there? I know he's uh, taking part today. Uh, Eight double one double one. Uh, the text if you want to. Let us know who's running for you. Hashtag London Marathon. Excuse me. I'm being told the mayor. Hashtag BBC London Marathon. There you go. 
BBC Paula, you Marathon. Read that. Hashtag BBC Marathon. Or text your message to 81111. Thanks. And we have got the sunshine at last, which is lovely to see. Uh, it'd be a great day for running. It really is uh, turned out to be a, a, a wonderful day weather-wise, which helps everybody. The men's elite front of the race, though, it's just settled again, hasn't it? Just not kind of sparked yet. Looked as though it might do. Gabriel Selassie might try to move away, but has been persuaded uh, in his own head probably that's not such a smart movement it's Bashir Abdi now at the front and in fact Kenanisa Bekele has dropped off the pace there I thought there was one missing and it's Kenanisa Bekele and uh, that's what 50 meters Paula so he's, he's gone off the lead pretty quickly there yeah I think that is a, a significant gap now and unfortunately for Kenanisa Bekele I think now he is going to be running on his own for the rest of this race. He doesn't look as though he's in danger of dropping back substantially and being caught by the other racers further back, um, but he's certainly not able to go with this race that's winding up and winding up at the front. You can see the mass runners going by on the other side of the road, just getting an impression of just how fast these men are running at the front and probably wishing they were at that point in the race rather than the point they're at, but they still have a lot of fun and entertainment still to come. And for the first time, Bashir Abdi is at the front trying to urge the pace on a little bit now. Susie Lemma just moving across to get back in the middle of the group there. His teammate. Just allowing him round the back. So Gabriel Selassie, Legese, Lemma, Tano, all Ethiopian runners uh, letting Bashir Abdi and Amos Kipruto just dictate things at the middle. Again, there's not really putting a lot of pressure on. It's interesting, isn't it? You, 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 we're looking at faces, we're looking at style. We're trying to read their minds, aren't we? Who's feeling good, who's not? As uh, Gabriel Selassie almost steps across the guesser there. You know, you're looking for those little signs, aren't you? And they're looking for it as well, and they'll be listening out for it as well. They watch across and see any sign of weakness in, in the other runners, any sign that somebody's breathing is a little bit more laboured than and it was a while ago, maybe a slightly harder footfall. Uh, and they're all signs that someone your rival is starting to fatigue and you might be trying to make a move to, to push away and also looking at the form coming into the race. So some of the men in this group will have looked and calculated too that Bashir Abdi is trying to come back from a third place in that World Championships in Eugene and a hard run there. And as Judith Career showed, that's a little bit hard to turn it around so quickly and come back into a very fast race to here. They're also calculating they've got to get their feed bottles and their drinks on board and really important at this stage in the race that they don't neglect that because there's a lot of hard racing still to go but it's also a point where you can throw a surge down so drink quickly uh, as Bashir Abdi has just done uh, and then try and push on the pace a little bit in fact so quickly he drank that Gebra Zalassi is looking across and thinking did you mean to throw that away but no he's passing it to his his training teammate the guesser well, they're spread across the road. That tells you as much as you want to know, really, doesn't it? And gathering themselves for what could be a significant break, because any breaks at this point, you can tell. I mean, I don't think Bekele's losing any more ground at the moment. That's, you know, they've kind of settled, if you like. What about further back down the course here? We've got seven men you can see. Then there's a bit of a gap to Wayne Gebre Selassie, but not far behind him is Phil Sessiman. So this is a really good scrap for the first British athlete. Wayne is going well. Phil Sessiman not that far behind him, and he can see down the road ahead of him. He's going to see Brett Robinson. That's the figure you can see just in the distance disappearing around the corner. And then about 10 seconds ahead of him is Gebri Selassie. Wayne Gebri Selassie. So Phil Sessiman and Gebri Selassie running a great race today. Gebri Selassie really did commit. There's Robinson. And then just ahead of him, you can see Wayne Gabriel Selassie. There he is. So that's Robinson, the Australian. So the two British athletes with the Australian in between them. And Gabriel Selassie, 
is in eighth place. So you've, you know the top seven, and then this is eighth, ninth, and tenth. So what a performance so far from the Shetston Harrier. Looks, again, moving okay, but this is the tough bit of the race, isn't it? Back on the highway, as you said, Paula, maybe get inspired a bit by the runners coming in the other direction. Yeah, a little bit of encouragement there. We saw them move through that colourful section there as well, known as Rainbow Row, which is set out with the support from the LGBTQIA plus community uh, and certainly added a bit more to the carnival atmosphere that's going on there. But from that overhead shot, you can really see the encouragement being shouted from these runners who are tired, but they're using a little bit of that energy to cheer on the elite runners in this race and yeah a little bit of a thought here for Mo Farah because I think had he been able to be out there in the race today he would have really loved to, to savour the atmosphere of this London Marathon so hopefully he'll be back in April to do that one more time. It almost looks from that shot as though Bikel is moving back to them doesn't he but I think that does slightly for shorten the gap but certainly he's not out of this race yet and if he's able to maintain concentration and almost use the the bike camera bike in the middle to gauge off and to try and focus on on the back of in terms of keeping his race going but certainly this group has settled they're taking on a little bit of water there's nobody yet throwing down any big surge that's going to do any damage to the others. This is interesting for me, just Lemma. He, he came across for a drink and uh, pushed, well not pushed, but that kind of pushed him to the front. So now he's there, does he stay there? Does he start to try and say, hey, I know how to win this. And uh, all of a sudden, they've kind of gathered round him, haven't they? So last year's winner, Cissé Lemma, is there. So these six ahead and changes further back because Gabriel Selassie may just be struggling a little bit because Robinson has just gone past him and we know that Phil Sesserman is not far behind so that's an Australian wearing number 13 but 14 is Wayne Gebrselassie he's looking at his watch I wonder whether he's looked behind because if he does he'll know and we'll see that his fellow Brit Phil Sesserman is not too far adrift I'm just trying to work out I'll tell you in about one second because the <laughs> their split time is just coming through on the computer. Gabriel Silas is now in ninth place. Phil Sesserman. Is there, but I think, if anything, they've both slowed a little. And I'm just wondering whether Phil Sesserman has stopped actually catching Gabriel Silasi. He must be able to see him, he's probably about 30 seconds. In fact, uh, it's just come through, he's at 29 seconds behind. And the pace for both of them has just slipped outside 210, or the predicted pace for both of them. So, Great Britain with athletes in ninth and 10th. Gabriel Selassie at the moment, looking as though he could hang on to be the first British athlete at home, but can Phil Sessman find a little bit extra in the last few miles to do what he did last year. At the moment, heading for a personal best. Right ahead of these guys, though, so the race on at the front. And we've seen two, three people try to break it up, and all of a sudden we've got five in that group now. And I think... I can't see last year's winner in there. So it's Legesse who's moved on, Kipruto. It looks like Cissé Lemma, last year's winner, has dropped off. He's now about 30, 40 metres behind these five men. Legesse leading, Atenar, Kipruto, Gebri Selassie, and <laughs> Bashir Abdi. I know Paul will be getting excited because uh, Bashir could win, it would be a massive performance from him two bronze medals in the major championships but to win a major to win a world marathon major is a huge thing Kipruto though still looking strong 
Yeah, 5K to go now, and the racing is really on, and they've knocked one out the back door, if you like, uh, with Cisse Lemma, and they will be aiming to try and whittle that down even more, and perhaps by trading turns out the front, you can see Kipruto urging someone around. I think he's trying to say, if you're going to sit behind me to Vitalo, then you need to come by and actually do some work, or you don't run right on my heels. That's not really done. You can draft a little bit, but there isn't a huge amount of wind out there today but actually impeding and clipping someone's heels it is not on at all and indeed it's spurred Kipruto on to lay down a little bit more of a surge the others at the moment are able to respond to that Gebri Selassie now drifting to the back of that group having been the one putting down surges early on yeah Bashir Abdi still running well I'm just wondering can you explain what the different colored numbers mean some have got purple yellow green white yeah. I mean, you know, you, we, we, you know better than anybody else. You know, you suddenly can get a bit of a lift and last couple of miles, you start thinking you're catching the group and you, you, you know, he's what? Five, six seconds behind Bikili? That's not insurmountable. And one thing you know about him is when he's in a race, you know, when he's still involved, he will fight hard, he will keep going. He's a great champion, Bikili, but that's an agonizingly close uh, gap to that group, but on the other hand, it's tough to make it up, particularly when there's enough men in this to push it on. And it's the two London debutants who are leading this at the moment. Kindia Tano has the lead. Capruto tucked in behind him. Gabriel Selassie trying to keep moving. Abdi might just wait his turn, wait for the last kilometer, maybe the last half, maybe the last few hundred meters to make a move. Can Bikili catch them? They certainly need to be aware of that and they can't allow this trading of work at the front and looking around to in any way jeopardize the, the gaps that they've built up behind them uh, and certainly Bikili is head down maintaining that pace and sticking to the task uh, and keeping his concentration sometimes his concentration does drift uh, as we've said but it, it doesn't seem to be today he's trying to pour everything into this race here in London and there is Wayne Gebrselassie who certainly is a lot more tired than he was early on he's managing to keep things moving forward at this point but very very hard and will be retreating to all of those places that he's found in training to just keep the mind focused and the body moving forward when everything is so tired i think he's had a little bit of a bad patch and he's definitely slowed but he's running strong enough and looks good this crowd will help will lift him a little bit and he's heading for a top 10 finish and hopefully a big personal best as well but he will have to keep on this will have to keep strong in the last kilometers through 35k a little while back he dropped down the hill that just gives you a little bit of kick off the lift now look at this this is Kipruto trying to win it he was the pre-race favorite for many and all of a sudden he's gone and Bashir Abdi trying to hang on with Gebri Selassie so Kipruto this is a real big push a real bid to try and win this it's gone hard now is it too hard too soon or is he confident that he's going to be able to maintain this Gabriel Selassie and Abdi just not able to go with it you could see Gabriel Selassie thinking shall I just back off now I'm not going to hang on to that I've got to be sensible here but Kip Ruto is flying it's decision time for those following and you have to make that decision really quickly already the last mile was 436 and he's now kicked from that so very very quickly there they all had to make a decision do I go with it or do I maintain my pace and rhythm and just hope that he's pushed it on a little bit too early and you can see head down from Gebre Selassie chasing there but he certainly made the decision that no he was going to stay and work with Bashir Abdi and hope that they can work together to try and get back to Kipruto but certainly that was a determined and well judged surge at this point from Kipruto can he maintain it he's the only one who really knows that really knows 
what he has left in his legs at this point. And that was smart, just a quick glance over his shoulder. Not enough really for anyone to pick up behind as a sign of weakness, but enough to give him the information that he needs, that he has in fact built up quite a substantial gap up that incline out of the underpass. Well, behind him, Kevin Selassie just looking and uh, realizing that Bashir Abdi is just tucking into the well, to his heels, if you like. Uh, Bassa is there, a bit further back. Kenan Issa he suddenly was getting close to this group, and then all of a sudden it just all broke up as Kiprito kicked on and decided that was the point in which he wanted to move it. They've just been hanging on to each other too much, really. And so he looks as though he's beginning to head for what would be a great victory for him. Third, a bronze medal at the World Championships in those incredibly difficult conditions in Doha in 2019. But here in London, what a win this would be for him. His birthday was a couple of weeks ago. And he chased his great hero, Elliot Kipchoge, home in Tokyo earlier on in the year when he ran his personal best. But he was a long way, he was quite a way behind Kipchoge on that occasion. But goodness me, he's looked so strong here. And away he goes. He has, and he has run the fast times. He's run that 2.03.13 from Tokyo, second fastest in the world so far this year, and I think will still be so at the end of this race here today. Uh, well, actually, probably without a doubt now, and just trying to, to get a glimpse back down the road to that intriguing battle between uh, Bashir Abdi. Uh, is he, is he They're trading, aren't they? They're trading between the two of them and but not making any inroads at all in fact that lead is just continuing to grow at the moment to Kipruto and that will just be giving him even more energy to to push on he knows he's done it uh, he's got a clear road ahead of him and, and he can kind of relax as much as you can when you're running at the pace that he's running at here today Well, well done for him for being patient and backing himself, realising what he was capable of and just judging it right. That's all you have to do. You just have to use your head in conjunction with your body in the marathon. When it's your day, it's your day. And Capruto looks strong, he looks fast. And although we're not heading for any records here today, he is somebody who has produced the right race at the right time here he's still got a good chance of going under 2.5 i think well that period where they just slowed a bit i think you'll find there 158 27 through 40k so he's just got over just over 2k to go so yep he'd have to go some but definitely a possibility he's gonna be right around the 2.5 mark isn't he there thereabouts yeah, which is still very quick running. It's just by the measure of how much, essentially, Kipchoge, but Kipchoge and others have moved forward that barometer for men's marathon racing. I mean, we talked about 20 years ago today. 20 years ago today, there was a men's world record set here in the London Marathon by Khalid Kanuchi, and that was 2.5. So it's taken that long for us to say that 2.5 is actually not really a quick time um, but it is still a very fast time and it's the way that it's been run today and I think as we've seen the way that Kipruto just judged that surge up that pull out of the underpass to perfection and just at the maximum hurt time for everyone else he was able to throw that in and crest out of it and just maintain that pace and that rhythm So he'll get to Big Ben, and that is 1,200 metres to go when he makes that turn, uh, and then 1,200 metres of essentially a victory, big lap into the finish. Well, we've got a wonderful view there, looking down as he heads towards Big Ben. And that's a pretty good lead he's got now. There's a really good scrap going on for second, third, and fourth behind him, and that's what it is, though. It's a race for second, third, and perhaps uh, Etano can just try and get himself latched on to 
Bashir Abdi, who's leading Gebre Selassie. He's hanging on to him at the moment. Just keeps looking behind, though, doesn't he? Sees his teammate just behind. But at the front, Kipruto looking so strong. He says that uh, he grew up learning about Sami Wanjiru, the Olympic champion from 2008. Uh, he sadly died uh, in an accident after that, but he's the man, he said, who inspired me to get going. And in recent years, it's been Elliot Kipchoge, of course it has. And he runs for the same team as Elliot Kipchoge and knows him well. Ran for Kenya at the Olympics, didn't manage to finish on that occasion despite that bronze medal at the World Championships. Tricky conditions in Tokyo as well, or in Sapporo indeed, where the Olympic marathon was held. But today, it's been very much to his liking. Just needs to keep pushing on. I mean, I know you're right, Paula. Oh, look at this. Uh, a bit of a break here from Gebre Selassie to try and get away. There you see the scrap for third. Sadly, Bashir Abdi could well be coming on with the man who comes third all the time. Uh, he might be on for another third yet. Um, just needs to keep working hard, as, as we were saying today, on very tired legs. A lot of racing already this year and trying desperately, isn't he, Bashir Abdi, in those yellow armbands to work himself back at least onto the heels of Gebre Selassie. Uh, and then to try and surge from there and also trying to draw himself away from Matano, who's trying to, to chase him in. So a lot still to play, certainly for this second, third and fourth here at this stage. But no question, I don't think, about the man who's going to win it. The question is just how fast will he run? Oh, what a day for Amos Kipruto. The Kenyans who are always wanting to come and run well here but they were concerned that they didn't have you know enough guys in the race of all various dropouts but to be fair while amos cabrito was on the start list they had somebody who definitely had the ability to win this and i think he's shown why so many people thought certainly in the elite ranks that he might be the man to beat and he's proven to be exactly that Looks calm, doesn't he? Looks so good, looks so in control. Lovely running action, very economical. Great running from him. Yeah, looks serene. I mean, it's not warm here today, but he's barely sweating either, so his physiology is working so, so efficiently. All of that heat has just been wicked away and the sweat has been evaporated as fast as he's running, and he's running phenomenally quickly. And I think he's just taking it perhaps below that 205 barrier, which is still a measure of a very quick running, as we were saying, and you can see in that shot down the road there, are spreading across the road in that battle for second, third, and fourth in a way bid to, to just try and maybe creep up uh, on someone without them quite expecting it. I just took that... <laughs> Island a little wider than he needed to that might just rob him of the couple of seconds that he might need to run under 2.5 He's moving nicely enough. I'm not sure we'll see him sprint and again Gabriel Selassie doing exactly the same uh, It doesn't really matter a bit further back and Anissa Bekele is moving up another spot as well But they're a long way behind Second and third and even further behind this man here Amos Kipruto So Kipruto will be enjoying these moments, perhaps the biggest of his career, so much so that he manages a bit of a wave. He's not so bothered about the clock here. He has run quicker. He's personal best set in Tokyo earlier this year. But this is his moment. This is his day. This biggest win of his career, the world bronze medalist from 2019, becomes the London Marathon champion of 2022. And it is well inside two hours five. Great performance from Amos Kipruto. Looked so good for so long. And when he made the move, it was a decisive one. Trusted himself. He does look tired now for the very first time, and so he should be. But what a good performance from him. Well, little Gebri Selassie was not one of the more fancy, certainly of the Ethiopians who is here, but what a race from him as well. Really good performance, managing to hold off Bashir Abdi. So he takes second place, Lil Gabri Selassie. Congratulations to him. And then Abdi, third in a big race again. 
his two other thirds have been in the Worlds and the Olympic Games. So Atano hangs on for fourth place. And I think this is going to be Kenelisa Bekele who's going to come in next in fifth place. So another good performance. Don't forget Kenelisa Bekele, despite being one of the greatest of all time, he's 40 now. And to still be running at this level, he's going to run under two hours and six. Great to see him here in London. That's a solid run from Kenanisa Bekele. He comes in fifth place. And I think this will be Legese coming in behind him. Congratulations, teammate. Congratulations to Bashir Abdi for him as Legese. Rather tired looking Legese just crosses the line. The next thing we'll be looking for is the first of the British athletes to come through. I can tell you that the gap between them, all the way at uh, third, excuse me, 40k, was still about the same, about 30 seconds. So I think Gabby Selassie is definitely a uh, Wayne Gabby Selassie, just not to confuse the two. Will have enough to hang on to be the first British athlete. There's last year's winner, Cecil Lemma, just coming into the mall. Tired. He had a go, didn't he? You have to say, Paula. He did. You can they have a great example of the contrast and that decision you have to make when it just feels a little bit too quick for you. Bekele made that decision and dropped back early on and he was able to come through to fifth in the end. So Salema decided to just stick with it as long as he could and that is now a painful way to finish the marathon. But he's stuck to it and he is, he's going to get there. Uh, but yeah, it's really, really hurting him right now. Well, he's just about jogging in. It looks like a jog for somebody like him, for everybody else. Those of us sitting here included are still running pretty quick. But he did fall away rather at the end. 2.725 there, thereabouts, for last year's winner. Well, there are the three men who will stand on the podium eventually to get their prizes rather than just towels. Kipruto winning London in his first run here in London. Great performance from him. So Kenya will be so pleased that they found a London champion. And Elliot Kipchoge, I'm sure, who is here watching, will have enjoyed that win. Well, as we watch slow motion of Kipruto crossing the line. We are waiting for Kevin Selassie and Phil Sessaman, first of the British athletes to come in. They're not too far away, as we can look down on the scenes here with Buckingham Palace. Victoria Memorial looking resplendent as ever. I was nearly going to say in the sunshine, but just clouded over again. Further back down the course. Lots of people uh, still in the early stages of their London Marathon. Cutty Sark getting ticked off. And then they can start to look forward to, I guess, Tower Bridge is the next big landmark for them. Yeah, just an idea from on those last two shots, the overhead of the great finish here on the Mall, Buckingham Palace overlooking everything that's going on. Cutty Sark there, Tower Bridge, of course, so many great landmarks shown off today uh, in the city of London and the city of London really shown off uh, and how well it can receive and put on great races, just make people feel welcome. I think very much the vibe out there amongst the runners at the Expo was that it is the friendliest race to come to of all of the marathons around because of the way that the crowd welcomes them. And here's Brett Robinson coming in to finish. Yeah, Brett Robinson's run a good race, went through uh, perhaps a difficult patch. He was on two hours, eight pace for a lot of the race, which would have been a that's the best for him. But Robinson now just inside two hours and ten. So he's going to be in eighth place. And the next two athletes in will be the two British athletes, Wayne Gebre Selassie, who I think there he is, coming down Birdcage Walk, is going to hold off. Phil Sessaman, the two of them, pretty tired. The sort of race that uh, they've both put together in the past where they kind of run at about 2.10 pace, not, just not quite able to hang on to that. This year, he almost he was at 2.8 pace and not quite able to hang on to that. So a brave effort 
he still could run a personal best if he can somehow raise his game. He's looking at his watch, he's aware of it, but when you're tired, you are tired and you can't really lift those legs anymore. Even lifting his arm, I think, to see and to check on his time, because he knows how agonizing close to his personal best he is. You can see on the clock there, 2.10.40, and his personal best, 2.12.17 from Rotterdam earlier this year. So he can do it, but it's a big, big, big ask on really, really tired legs, and you can see Harry Fry there indicating where he has to go. He knows full well where he has to go. He's got a couple more turns to make. He'll see Buckingham Palace. He's got to make that turn again. And then finally, finally, finally for him, he'll see that big TCS finish barrier up ahead and just try and get himself there as quickly as possible. Well, he's just coming around the last corner, and in, on any other day, if he was out for a run, he'd look up that finish line and say, I can make that in under a minute. But he's tired, his legs are dead, he gave it a go, he had a real... have a, you know, an effort, that he put it in, in terms of mentally and physically to try and run under 210. He's not going to do that, so he's now only got his own personal best. And Phil Sessiman is right behind him, is chasing him. And it looks as though Gabriel Selassie is just about going to run a personal best, so well done to him. Can it be under 2 hours and 12? He's so, so tired, and he crosses the line in a new personal best, and it will be a new personal best for Phil Sessiman as well. So well done to the two of them in ninth and 10th place. What a good race between them. Phil Sessiman was closing quickly in the final stages, not quite getting there, so he was the first Brit last year but has to give way to Wayne Gebre Selassie. The two of them, though, not too far apart from each other. Both of them running personal bests. And Phil Sessman's face really just said it all then, didn't it, as he crossed the line. Everything, absolutely everything that he had to give, he's given out there on that course, as has Gebre Selassie. Uh, and as we said, when you're trying to will yourself to that finish line, you really can't on such tired legs afford to get dragged into that, trying to raise it to, to sprint for the line. It is about trying to keep everything moving forward and just get yourself somehow to that line and then everything can stop and then he can look back and be proud of the way that he's run that race today and where he can go in the future just by building on that and getting that a little bit stronger well he looks tired doesn't he and you, yeah i think you know you learn so much you know he's had such a good year and um, he, he might think well that was an opportunity to go a bit quicker but you know it's still a personal best and He's still the first British athlete home. Well done for that. In a under 212 for the first time. He does look a little disappointed though, doesn't he? Maybe he had his sights set a little higher, but top 10, nothing wrong with that. Well, let's have a... was the best of the sprinters for the third spot. Great to see him doing that in his 23rd London Marathon.
For Catherine de Brunner, it was an altogether different story. Led pretty much from the beginning and had a lonely ride, a lonely race to have to contend with. One hour 38.24, though, after winning in Berlin, following it up with a win here in London. Susanna Scaroni taken second. And what a great performance from Eden Rainbow Cooper to come through for third. Well, they were our two wheelchair marathon winners, and we caught up with them afterwards. Marcel, I'll start with you first. You know, wonderful Swiss success here today at the London Marathon. How was that race for you and also that battle you had with Daniel? Uh, to be honest, it was really, really tough. I think it was the, one of the toughest marathons since a very long time. I tried everything to, to break away from Daniel. Attacked so many times, but uh, no chance today. He was uh, just too strong. And so in the end, I'm very happy that I it could make the, the sprint finish first and um, yes, yeah, so I'm really happy. I know we could see you turning around and talking at times. Did you want Daniel to do a little bit of the work, help you out along the way? Uh, I even did not try to, to let him lead. Uh, I tried to, to keep up the pace and try to make him tired uh, as possible. And uh, yeah, that was the plan. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. Congratulations to you. Uh, Catherine, let me come to you because you made your marathon debut last week in Berlin. You won there and a week later you're here in London winning again. I mean, this is a phenomenal result. Yeah, it has been a crazy year for me. <laughs> I, I did Berlin for the first time. It was such a great adventure and experience. And I knew that uh, London is going to be a completely different route. It's uh, called a really difficult one with a lot of turns. The routes are rough and uh, it's going uphill, it's the bridge, everything. And it was a little special because just before the start, two of the best marathon racers could not uh, go to the start line because they did not feel well, Manuela Char and Madison de Rosario. So I spoke with uh, Susanna Scaroni and we actually planned to work together and I don't realize when it was, but I think pretty in the beginning, when it was going downhill, I suddenly saw her that she was far behind. And then I thought I have to do all myself. But it was the toughest race I've ever done. I really suffered. What is it about the marathon that suits you so well? Well, I've worked really hard in the summer in the Netherlands together with my teammate Rens van der Wattelaat. And I found out just before the start that he's here, surprise. I'm so happy. Also his girlfriend is here. And I saw a big progression during those three months, but I never uh, expected to win those marathons. It's quite cheeky, <laughs> but it's unbelievable. Yeah, absolutely. A great day for Switzerland in London. Congratulations on the victories. Well done, Marcel, well done, Thank Catherine. you so much. Yes, a wonderful Swiss double from Marcel and Catherine. They were speaking to Sarah Mulcairn there. And, of course, a huge thanks to Steve Cram, Paula Radcliffe and Baroness Tani Gray-Thompson for their superb commentary. So, from the elites, we now turn to the masses. And just look at the sight you can see. A beautiful sea of bobbing heads on this most iconic of courses. 40,000 out there right now. Around 10,000 are running it across the world virtually as well. The London Marathon truly is a wonderful, emotional and physically demanding occasion. So many people coming together for so many brilliant reasons. And Cutty Sark there, I imagine these sights. When you've never run it before, I imagine when you get to that point, when you get to Tower Bridge, you know, you've seen it on the TV and it just must give you a lift, keep you going. You hear the crowd shouting your name, shouting the charity you're running for on your vest. and. And you know, you've still got quite a way to go. <laughs> well, those elite races were great, but we're here now, our new position. Do you like it? It's pretty good, isn't it, at the mile? The finish here, you see the masses will start pouring down very soon, and that's what we're concentrating on here on BBC One between now and 2.30 p.m. We will hear so many great stories of inspiration and wonderful causes that people are running for. And, uh, of course, we'll be out on the course meeting some of those people as well along the way. It really is a life-affirming experience for those taking part. And today, here in the shadows of Buckingham Palace, emotions will be even higher 
It's only 13 days since the eyes of the world were focused on the capital for the state funeral of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. The royal family have a very strong connection with the marathon and we're going to highlight that later in the programme where we're going to speak to some very special people and tell their incredible stories. So here is a taster of what's to come. We meet the Downey sisters, who are doing so much to promote heart screening after losing their brother, Josh. After spending five years in an Iranian jail, Anusha tells his harrowing story now he's finally running free. A new rule here means Aaron and other assisted wheelchair users can take part, and as his family tell us, they cannot wait. We meet the wonderful Ella, who challenges discrimination and inspires others to be proud of who they are. The mini-marathon is bigger than ever before. We'll catch up with all the fun and meet potential champions of the future. And as for the ultimate champion, well, that is the great Elliot Kipchoge. And he's with us today as a special guest, fresh from setting yet another world record. Well, they are just some of the incredible people you're going to hear from a little bit later and see out on the course. I'm sure you've got your own incredible people at home that you're looking out for as well. And maybe you want to send messages of support and good luck and videos. Well, you can do just that. Send them all in to us and we'd love to hear from you. Text your message to 81111 and we will try our very best to get them on the screen. Now though, let's get you out on the streets and take in that glorious sight, a sea of faces, and keep your eyes peeled. You may spot that special loved one out there running for a cause close to your heart. I can feel it all around. 
Well, I'm delighted to say that I have been joined here by the world record holder of the men's marathon. He broke his own record last week in Berlin. It's Elliot Kipchoge. Great to see you here. It's strange seeing you here and not out there on the course. Uh Absolutely. It's really strange. <laughs> it's, I really feel tennis. I'm not running, but uh, it's watching people actually run. You've still got your fan club behind uh, us, though, here. Lots it's of my Kenyan fans. Flags. Are, yeah, I'm from Kenya. <laughs> really strange. <laughs> They've loved seeing you here today, and we'll see you a little bit later what you've been up to the last 24 hours or so. But let's go back a week to Berlin and your splits. You were under 60 minutes for the first half of that marathon. Were you at that point thinking that you could keep that pace going? Did you think the first sub two hour marathon in an IAAF course was going to be a reality for you, Elliot? Uh, it was really pretty fast, past a half. But only knows that was uh, a huge motivation for me to, to cross halfway under an hour. There you are, running it there, under the Brandenburg yeah. gates. What was your feeling like at that moment? Uh, I was really feeling good, and uh, I tell myself, please let me try to push myself to see whether I can, I, I can run uh, two hours flat. But uh, my plan was to break a world record. So <laughs> and you did that. Minimal, yes. <laughs> and I caught it. I'm you happy for that. You keep doing this, you keep pushing the boundaries. I was there the day you did it in Vienna and you run under two hours that day. Of course, that wasn't an official record, but you've shown it can be done. How much more can you achieve, Elliot, over 26.2 miles? Oh, the future actually still also looks pretty good for me. And I trust that uh, uh, running under two hours on a normal uh, marathon like this one of London is really possible and it's only to to get the right systems in 
put uh, your mind together and get all the pieces in your mind, put it together and, and actually focus on the on and running and bringing the party. And of course, today, the elite races, what did you make of the men's and women's winners, Kiprito and Yehalor of Ethiopia? Uh, I want to register my congratulations to, 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 to Kipruta and uh, to, to all top three. It was a huge race, it was a huge motivation uh, to see them actually crossing the line, uh, 204, 205, it's a really pretty fast time. Let me just ask you a little bit about when you run like a world record you did last week and what happens in the following few days, you know, to you and your body and how you kind of prepare yourself then for the next one. Do you just completely shut down? Do you stop? Do you go off and just eat what you like, sleep? How does it work? Uh, after breaking a world record, then I had to internalize what has happened, see what has happened, what has been happening for the last five months. Uh, start to focus on what actually still in front of myself and enjoy life and actually move on. So you never really stop, do you? You're always planning for the next one. So yes. what are we going to see you doing next? Um, I can say for now I'm really concentrating purely on, 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 on my recovery. But uh, at the, in my pocket list, actually, I still uh, want to run uh, the whole, whole, uh, whole half of six uh, major marathons to get that uh, six uh, star medal. Yeah, well, of course, here in London, we've seen you cross the line uh, four times. You've done that here yeah. first. And it's, it's a course you clearly love. You just mentioned there you think it's possible to run under uh, two hours on a course like London. The atmosphere today has been incredible, hasn't it? Today, actually, it was the great uh, it's the, the atmosphere is, uh, is great. The, uh, the weather actually is perfect. And I think it's, uh, it's possible to run under two hours. It's possible to run two hours. Anything can happen actually in a moment like this in London. And that was always especially your motivation. London, especially next year London will be actually in spring. Yes. And I think weather will be more perfect for them today. So you think the spring time marathon for the London Marathon, of course three times we've run it in October, is more conducive for faster uh, times? Absolutely, yes. I, I, I can say actually the spring in London is more convenient, more conducive. And, and, uh, and we'll catch a lot of... So we'll see times. you on April the 23rd then, is that what I'm hearing? Uh, <laughs> the future will tell. <laughs> we wish, we hope. Yes. Thank you so much, Elliot. I'll speak to you a little bit later on about what else you've been up to around thank the you, London Marathon over the last...